long last, back to pyramids. You are listening to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons and monsters and serpents to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast, coming to you not live from the 10 by 10 by 10 tangent cube of science. Nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed, high atop the Edwards Plateau here in the Northern Hemisphere, where the sun is dead. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, we are in the midst of the solstitial darkness. It's a three-day pause of the uh, solar travel across the sky. And uh, so we wish you all happy holidays, happy solstice, worshiping your dark gods, Merry Christmas, uh, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, whatever it is you guys do on this <laughs> end of the year. <laughs> <laughs> the Watcher is uh, running around in his space a- ambulance right now, saving aliens or something. <laughs> uh, but he will be he will be tuning in when he can. But yes, he is on duty right now in space. So uh, we thank we give th- we thank him for being able to tune in when he can, even though he's on duty. He's on a twenty four. Uh, so he probably won't be talking to us from his bag of chips, but he will be paying attention when he can. And uh, cool, yeah. But let's go ahead and get uh, space weather news from spaceweather.com. Will Arctic skies turn green for Christmas or Kwanzaa? A minor stream of solar wind is approaching Earth. Estimated time of arrival: December twenty fourth and twenty fifth. No geomagnetic storms are expected, but the gaseous material could spark holiday auroras around the Arctic Circle. Also, a sunspot from the next solar cycle. All right. Hey. Breaking a string of 40 spotless days, a new sunspot is emerging in the sun's southern hemisphere. It comes from the next cycle. The unnumbered spot is inset in this map of solar magnetic field from NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory. And there's a photo here you can find on spaceweather.com. Is the polarity reversed? It is. He says, uh-huh. how do we know this sunspot belongs to the next solar cycle? Its magnetic polarity tells us so. The southern sunspots from old solar cycle 24 have a negative slash plus polarity. This sunspot is the opposite, plus slash negative. Cool. According to Hale's law, sunspots switch polarities from one solar cycle to the next. This sunspot is therefore a member of new solar cycle 25. Recently, we reported that solar minimum has reached a century class low. This sunspot, plus a few others like it earlier this year, affirm that solar minimum will not last forever. Solar cycle 25 is showing signs of life. Forecasters expect the next solar cycle to slowly gain strength in the years ahead and reach a peak in July of 2025. Also, this is pretty cool. The fainting of Betelgeuse. All the sacrifices paid off. (laughs) The sun is not dead. (laughs) One day, perhaps in our lifetimes, or perhaps 100,000 years from now, the red giant Betelgeuse, is that how you say that? Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse. Wow. Yeah, it's weird. Okay. (laughs) Betelgeuse will dim a little and then explode. The supernova will rival the full moon in the night skies of Earth and cast shadows after dark. This month, Betelgeuse has dimmed a little. So far, it has not exploded. So it's dimmed. But this it's month. Gonna, it's going to nova or micronova? Yeah, or so it's a red giant, and it's gonna get, it'll going to get suddenly much dimmer, and then boom, that's going to be wow. the nova. Yeah, the nova event. Uh, so it says, this month, Betelgeuse has dimmed a little, but it has not so far exploded. Alan Dyer photographed the star rising as usual with the rest of Orion on December 21st. And there's a picture there. He says, uh, quote, this Orion rising over my home in Alberta, Canada is on a partly cloudy day and foggy night. Uh, Yellow red Betelgeuse is shining at the upper left, reportedly dimmer than usual. Betelgeuse caused a sensation among professional astronomers earlier this month when Edward uh, Guinan Guinan of Villanova University and colleagues reported a significant fainting of the star. Betelgeuse has been declining in brightness since October 2019, now reaching a modern all-time low of V equals plus 1.12 mag on 07 of December 2019 UT, they wrote. Currently, this is the faintest the star has been during our 25-plus years of continuous monitoring. Astronomers have long known that Betelgeuse is on the precipice of an energy crisis. It's about to run out of fuel in its core. When that happens, the star will collapse and rebound explosively, producing the first known supernova 
in the Milky Way since 1604. Experts in stellar evolution believe Betelgeuse could die at any time during the next 100,000 years. <laughs> a blink of an eye <laughs> on time scales was of astronomy. like, next month? <laughs> are we, I mean, what are we? <laughs> no, 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 no. Next 100,000 years, guys. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, you know. Could be next month, though. Yeah, it could be. The that's, current that's included dimming, in the, current, the next 100,000 years. It is. It is, yes. Tomorrow is included in the next 100,000 right. years. The current dimming did not herald that final blast. Betelgeuse is also a slow, variable star. And this seems to be no more than an episode of slightly deeper than usual dimming. Orion remains intact for now. But if it does go, that's the thing. It is the upper. So if you're looking at Orion, the three belt stars, it's the it's the part of his shoulder on the left. It's his left shoulder. If that oh. if it explodes, we're going to lose Right. The asterism of He's Orion. gonna loose his bow. That's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, anyway, he's 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 pointing at uh where's his bow pointing at? Oh. I knew this. Uh uh Ophiuchus. Isn't okay. he pointing at Ophiuchus? I don't know. That the isn't that Orion or maybe that's Her Hercules. Yeah, that's Hercules. That. I'll look it up. Yeah. Keep going. Anyway, that's Watch the end it. of Space Weather News. Uh, let's Saving see. Saving people's lives and <laughs> helping me out with my <laughs> astronomy. Current conditions, solar wind speed 359.0 kilometers per second, and the density is 4.2 protons per cubic centimeter. Uh, and the sun is a blank circle with... They have a circled place where the new sunspot is, but I can't see it in the picture of the sun. It is just a blank yellow circle. So, what else we got here? I have some communications. Oh, I got a couple of reviews. Uh, five star reviews from five star review from Doctor Owl via Apple Podcast. The title of the review is "Ha ha ha," and then the entire <laughs> review is a bunch of laughing. Uh, five stars. Thanks, buddy. I'm glad uh, you're enjoying the podcast. Also, from Real America. This is a three-star review. He says, all shows, how about you skirp turds explain anything? Rambling with pipes must pay well. Uh, no. And we don't explain stuff because we don't understand anything. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the three stars, buddy. Appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> He's mad because we don't explain stuff. I don't know. Hmm. Started episode t uh, two? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Yeah, you got some emails here. I think he's. That, what I was thinking was that he's shooting at Scorpio, but <clears throat> I'm not. I'm not sure. Scorpio. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. He tried to battle the scorpion, but he quickly realized that he could not shoot his arrow through the creature's armor. So yeah, he's, oh, okay. he's so pointing he's battling at Scorpion. Scorpio. Okay. All right. Short email here from Mark. About Great Zimbabwe. He says, any idea regarding these ruins? And he gives a link here to the Wikipedia page for Great Zimbabwe. So, uh, Mark, the interesting thing to me about those ruins is that they are dated to have been constructed in the 11th century AD and they are abandoned. So basically what I'm saying is, is they seem to show up, be inhabited, and then are abandoned and the same period when the cathedral building exploded in Europe and the uh, cliff cultures exploded the in the Pueblo um, and Pueblo the, cultures. And the, uh, same period, basically. They show up and then they disappear right in the same period. Um, Chaco and Pueblo. Yes, and that's right. So that's, uh, I don't know if that's an idea, but that's an interesting thing about those. Explain that. Explain it? <laughs> <laughs> Can't. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Ian says, thanks for putting him onto Geocosmic Rex. He's going to be diving into Randall's hermetic stuff. Heck yeah. Okay, so we got a question about Bandcamp, about releasing the music on Bandcamp when you guys do your releases. Yeah, so I, I vaguely remember somebody saying something about this, but I just looked it up, and for artists... It says, sell directly to your fans with total control over your music and pricing, easy access to your customers' data, real-time stats, music, chart, reporting, and more. Sounds great. Yeah. Going to look into it further. 
So thanks for the thanks uh, for the heads tip. up on that. Yeah, the tip. Uh, yeah, and and whenever we do figure out what we're gonna do, I will let you guys know. For sure. Um, right now we're still, you know, trying to figure out what we're gonna do <laughs> with the music. Yeah. <laughs> still fighting. It's coming along. Still yeah. fighting over bass lines. That's right. No bunny hopping. <laughs> no camel walking. <laughs> no pony trotting. It's got to be smooth bass line. <laughs> Uh, Angie says she is sorry that she did not know that she sent an empty email. Uh, she says, I probably said what I wanted to say in a comment on YouTube on whichever episode I was watching that night, uh, which means it's more likely made no sense at all. But I do love you guys' podcast and have almost finished catching up on all of them. I first heard of you guys on Cosmographia, found that through Geocosmic Rex, watched your episode with Ben from Uncharted X and scribed Im and subscribed immediately. <laughs> cool. Thanks, thank Angie. You. She also says, I meant to thank you for the awesome rendition of the Rolling Stones. <laughs> <laughs> Angie! <laughs> Angie! <laughs> <laughs> totally empty email. <laughs> uh, what else we got? Uh, some YouTube comments I want to respond to. Um, if they'll come up here. Uh, okay. Steak and Eggs asks us if we can get Randall to look in the Astro Australian Ara Aboriginal story about the Rainbow Serpent. Uh, yeah, he does know about that, and we'll probably get around to talking about that at some point on Cosmographia. Uh, but thanks for the heads up on that. Also, Ricky says, hey, Snake Bros, could those white seals be the name of who really built the Great Pyramid? And I think he's talking about the seals that Kent were in the store. Right. I don't know. Possible. No one really knows because the, all that was left of those seals were little tiny bits of stuff. If they were seals in the first place. It's kind of interesting that there was, there was plaster smeared by hand into the cracks in the king's chamber. Yeah. Gypsum. Same type of plaster. Yeah. It's on the seals. That's right. I'm just saying. It is. Uh, Joel says, shout out to Uncharted X for recommending this podcast. Great podcast, guys. And he, that's right. So on Ben's last live stream that he mm -hmm. did, he totally gave us a big shout out. Oh, wow. So thanks, thanks so much to Ben. And anybody who hasn't checked out Uncharted X on YouTube, go check it out. Totally worth it. Top quality videos of some places that there aren't any videos and pictures of anywhere else. So really good stuff. Yeah. Ben knows what to look for. You know, it's not tourist videos, basically. Right. Um, let's see. <clears throat> uh, it's, uh, the Grand Watcher says, what about the guy who used explosives to get to the ceiling? Could this be the source of the quote unquote earthquake damage in the King's Chamber? Hmm. Uh, I think that was gunpowder. So I don't think it would be powerful enough to move all that granite. But good point. Like if it was dynamite, maybe. But yeah, the thing is, is that they were using plaster small, yeah, in, on the cracks. <clears throat> right. So that that plaster is ancient. That's true. Good point. But still, good question. Could have Grand moved Watcher. Him. Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering about the guy that was, you know, liquored up and smoking hashish. Like, yeah. How did? Where did he go? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When he blew those Blowing things, things up in a resonant chamber yeah. does not sound like a good idea to me. <laughs> uh, Sparkle Plenty says, quantum sticking device. <laughs> also, snakes. <laughs> <laughs> I guess they like the name. I think it's a great term. <laughs> uh, Karen says, Darren Q U is a climate controlled shopping mall. <laughs> Good point. Yes. Good point. Uh, let's see. Mm, I think that's it. Lots of lots of props. You know, fabulous show. Thank you guys. Great podcast. Good day, snakes. Been waiting for this. Guess I'm taking the afternoon off now. <laughs> lots of great uh, comments. Anyway, I just want to let you guys know we are paying attention to the YouTube comments, and thank you so much for all the comments on the yep. YouTube. Uh, also, check out the Bitmovio because somehow we get paid. I don't know how that works, but it, money happens. Um, and apparently, we're up to 100 bucks already on there. So 
it's uh, it's pretty serious. Okay, I think that's it for the commentary. So we got a couple other things here, David. The Jed drill. Yeah. So I checked out your um, what did he call it? The scrolling diagram or whatever. <laughs> yeah, the worst exploded view he's ever <laughs> yeah, used. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So all right, I'm I'm. I'm I'm ready to see this happen. I think I know what you're planning to do, and it's pretty cool. However, I'm curious to see what's going to happen to the flint if it makes a Clovis point. <laughs> <laughs> How you're drilling that granite? That would be amazing. That would be amazing <laughs> and explain a lot of stuff. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, one more thing here. On the Patreon, we have a bunch of tiers, and we have a new top tier donator. Frank, top tier donator. Now, Commander Frank, the Snake Bros Snake Force. Thanks, buddy. Really appreciate it. Yeah, man. <laughs> All the salutes go to you, sir. And <laughs> you should send us an email, and we'll make you a, um, you know, Commander Frank at snakepro.com or something. <laughs> yeah, whatever you want, man. Yeah, really Whatever appreciate you want. it. <laughs> yeah, man, top tier. So, anybody else want to be promoted to the Snake Bro Snake Force Commander? Just graduate to the top tier of the Patreon and you will become commander of <laughs> Snake Force. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You and you'll get your you'll get a jingle. Yeah, when your <laughs> name your is spoken. Very own jingle with the name spoken. You got uh, you got stories. I do. Um, so I just on before I get into the stories, uh, I looked up. We haven't had a sun probe update in a while. Oh yeah. So I was checking in on that. Um, I went to the Parker Solar Probe website, and uh, just oh, just idea. so you guys can can check it out. There's um, you know, the whole. Uh, schedule of events for the Parker Solar Probe. Um, there's diagrams of the of the missions because it's going to make multiple passes. What's the what's the website? Just ParkerSolarProbe.com or something? It's really complicated, and oh, I okay. think that's because I'm on. I think I'm on a specific page, but. Um, well, don't worry about it. They can find it. Just yeah, look up Parker Park Solar Probe. Okay. It's it's a it's a NASA website. Um, good grief! This is. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, it's got it's got all of the passes, and of course, it's coming out and and sort of uh, slingshotting around Venus ah. to uh, to cool. to bring it back. And it and every time it does that, it gets closer and closer and closer to the sun. So I was looking for some imagery because I think it's already made uh, two or three passes, a couple of close passes. Yeah, the five hundred, the five million mile pass, right. So the again the closest approach to, is going to be 3.83 million miles from the sun, extremely close. <laughs> um, the speed will be 430,000 miles per hour, which is 125 miles per second. Wow. The orbital period is 88 days. So every 88 days, it's going to be getting one uh, like a step closer to the sun every time it goes by. Nice. So just wanted to give you guys an update on that. Check out uh, Parker Solar Probe. Online, and you can see the diagrams. Oh, yeah. Uh, also, um, Earth's magnetic North Pole keeps moving towards Siberia. <laughs> <laughs> of course it does. Yes. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of explaining going on. Still no mention of the South Pole. Right. In any of the stories. Right. Even magnetic is, pole here. It is also m moving very quickly. It is. North. Is of it? Of course. Okay. It has to. It cannot move in any other direction. Well, you can't <laughs> have an you can't have a um, like one pole moving without the other one. See, I was thinking that maybe the south pole is more stationary for s somehow. That's actually they're actually approaching each other approaching at this each point. other okay but what i'm saying like the south pole's moving north north pole's moving south you can't they have to go in those directions <laughs> <laughs> do you see that map the most confusing it's map? moving at like 34 miles per year right now uh, which oh, is wow. faster than it's ever been moving in, yeah, in recorded fast. history that's fast yeah um still still cruising along towards siberia so wow 
Also, uh, I'm sure you guys have seen stuff about this, but the uh, recent launch of the, what is it called, this rocket? Uh, the Starliner rocket. So we're sending, we're, we're going to be sending people back to space, finally, ourselves. Oh, yeah. And uh, they did the Starliner launch. Uh, everything went well until the thing got into orbit. There was supposed to be some secondary firing of of uh, rockets to uh, actually get the trajectory towards the International Space Station. Those rockets, for some reason, were delayed. the The reason being given is something about two satellites being in a strange position where somehow they couldn't get the the command. To, I was just huh. like, "This is total crap." That's what classic NASA? <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah. <laughs> either that or journalistic malpractice. Right, can't tell. But um, <laughs> but anyway, those rockets were delayed just long enough to where they decided don't fire them at all because it's now going to be too hard to get the, the rocket back on track and yeah. we'll have to expend too much fuel and we don't want to be approaching the space station and then not be able to stop. Right? I agree with that. So they decided, let it orbit for a while, we'll collect some more data, and then bring it back down. And they successfully landed the module in the desert, not in the water. Wow. So the, it's nice. It, yeah, it came down, parachuted down, and then these huge airbags blew up <laughs> underneath it, and it, sa- it landed in white sands. Uh, wow, that's yeah. really cool. So great success there on, in many ways, and an epic failure at the same time. <laughs> Thank you, NASA. Classic NASA. Um <clears throat> giant bouncy ball from space. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Okay, so uh, my main story here is, uh, this is from 2017. This is the headliner, top of the fold, main story? This is main story, headliner, top of the fold. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) um, This is from strange, m.phys.org, P-H-Y-S. Yeah, so mobile... Mobile. Mo- it's fizz.org. Fizz.org. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, nerd guy. <laughs> no problem. Scientists capture <laughs> Earth's hum on ocean floor. December 7th, 2017 by Joseph Kariz from uh, American Geophysical Union. Nice. Scientists have long known earthquakes can cause the Earth to vibrate for extended periods of time. However, in 1998, a research team found the Earth also constantly generates a low-frequency vibrational signal in the absence of earthquakes. Since then, seismologists have proposed different theories to explain the existence of this continuous vibration, from atmospheric disturbances to ocean waves moving over the seafloor. They've also measured the vibration using seismometers on land, but had not yet successfully measured it at the seafloor which could help scientists better quantify the sources of the vibrations. Now, using seismic instruments on the bottom of the ocean, researchers have successfully quantified Earth's vibrational hum. A new study published in Geophysical Research Letters, a journal of the American Geophysical Union, determined at the ocean bottom the frequencies at which the Earth naturally vibrates and confirmed the viability of using ocean instruments to study the hum. Capturing the hum at the ocean bottom could provide new insights into the source magnitude, according to Martha Dean, a geophysicist at the Paris Institute of Earth Physics in Paris, France, and lead author of the new study. Additionally, the new findings could be used to map the interior of Earth with more detail and accuracy, including the hum from seismometers on the ocean seafloor. including the hum from seismometers on the ocean seafloor, can give a better overall picture than using land seismometers alone by increasing data coverage in large, uncovered areas, Dean said. Quote, Earth is constantly in movement, and we wanted to observe these movements because the field could benefit from having more data. End quote. So capturing the hum. The new research examined Earth's permanent free oscillations, low-frequency seismic signals that can only be measured with sensitive instruments. The vibration caused by these signals is constantly present in the ground and is observable in the absence of earthquakes. A previous study published in Geophysical Research Letters demonstrated the movement of ocean waves over continental shelves is responsible for generating a large portion of the signal and provided the first quantitative modeling of the hum over one year. 
Other research has suggested atmospheric turbulence as a source of the signal, but this mechanism can only explain part of the vibration. Most of the existing research on the hum signal successfully examined it using seismometers located on land, not at the bottom of, of the ocean. Gathering accurate data from seismometers beneath the ocean surface was regarded as impractical because ocean waves and seafloor currents generate high amounts of ambient noise. However, 70% of Earth's surface is covered by water, so being able to measure the hum on the seafloor would enable scientists to analyze the phenomenon using data over the entire globe, Dean said. In the new study, the researchers first gathered seismic data from 57 seismometer stations located at the bottom of the Indian Ocean east of Madagascar. These stations were deployed from 2012 to 2013 as part of an earlier study published in EOS, which was designed to image volcanic uh, intraplate hotspots. Hmm. The authors selected seismic data from the two stations with the highest data quality and made sure to correct for the signal generated by, by any earthquakes. They then applied a combination of techniques to remove interference from ocean infragravity waves, currents, and electronic glitches, and were able to reduce the noise level to approximately the same level as a quiet land station. Because Dean and her colleagues were able to account for these sources of interference, the researchers were able to successfully capture the hum using seismometers at the bottom of the ocean. The study determined the Earth's natural vibration peaks at several frequencies between 2.9 and 4.5 millihertz. Huh. These vibrations can't be heard by people because they are approximately 10,000 times smaller than the lower hearing threshold of the human ear, which is 20 hertz. That's a confusing yeah, that's sentence a there. So <clears throat> a millihertz is, is uh, one thousandth of a hertz, or hertz, right? One hertz is one second, basically. A vibration that takes place in one second. Uh, an oscillation that takes place in one second. So a millihertz vibration, one, one millihertz is one thousandth of a vibration in one second. So it would take you a thousand seconds to get one millihertz, okay? Uh, well, say that again. It would take a thousand seconds for for one millihertz to take place. Oh, okay. Right. That's why it's weird. They're saying it's smaller. The 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 actual wavelength is getting longer. Okay. All right. Okay. So, because <clears throat> I would expect, yeah, milli means a thousand. Yeah. But it, like it's going the other direction. Like a, like a millimeter is actually much smaller than a meter. Right. So if you <laughs> right. The it's time a, it's not a thousand meters, it's a thousandth of a meter. So yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's why it's it's confusing. It's confusing. The the time it takes, in other words, to basically I, I averaged out two point nine and four point five millihertz. Okay. So the average is like three point seven All right. millihertz. So if, if you said it was three point six, that would take one hour to take oh, place. Oh, I see. Okay. Wow. Yeah, that's, 3. A big, 6. that's a big wave. Yeah. Right. Long wave. Really long. Extremely low frequency. Right. Right. That's okay. why this 10,000 times smaller is not right. I think I'm I think I'm right about this cuz th these are extremely low frequency yeah. vibrations. Okay, see ten, th the sentence says 10,000 times smaller than the lower hearing threshold of the human ear, which is 20 hertz. So they're saying it's below that. 10,000 right. times below yeah. 20 hertz. Right. Right. 20 hertz is 20 vibrations per second. Yeah. So this is basically 3.6 thousandths yeah. of okay. that. Smaller than that. Yeah, I got it. Okay, it's, <laughs> it's really, it's confusing, it's, but yeah. yeah. Okay, guys. <laughs> we can't explain stuff. Sorry. <laughs> Just trust me on this one. I found this interesting that the, that the, the mean between these, this range that they said where it peaks at multiple different frequency levels is basically three, like yeah. 36,000. Right. 3,600 or, or 3,600. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so. Um, 360. Yeah. We're, we're yeah. back in the base, the, ba the 60. Right. So it takes an hour for one of these oscillations to take place. And I find that very interesting. So there's 24, roughly 24 of them an hour a day. That's right. 
Seems seems huh. to be in tune with what's going on, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I found very interesting. Okay, so the authors also compared the magnitude of their observed hum signal to measurements from a land station in Algeria and both and found both signals have a similar amplitude. Dean and her co-authors believe other researchers can apply their findings to better model the structure of the Earth's interior. Scientists traditionally examine the interior using seismic waves generated from earthquakes, but this only works at specific times and in areas where quakes commonly occur. Using the hum signal as a source of seismic waves would avoid this problem because the hum is generated continuously in many ocean continent areas at the planet's surface. Combining data from both land and the ocean bottom seismometers gives seismologists a more complete picture of the entire hum signal compared to using land stations alone, according to Dean. The increased density of possible data points would improve image resolution and could help scientists better map the Earth's interior down to 500 kilometers, or 310 miles, she said. In depth or resolution? Yes. Okay. Oh, maybe maybe resolution. Yeah. It says down, so I... Assumed in depth, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but this is, this is also interesting because, you know, Nikola Tesla... Right. Uh, ...suggested this possibility before he died um it was one of the last uh media i can't remember what, what he just basically held these press conferences where he talked about new ideas and new inventions yeah he had been working on the telegeodynamics yes. system which was a system that used a mechanical oscillator to input energy into the earth that would then resonate with the Earth's resonant frequency, but a, a harmonic of the Earth's resonant frequency, which would then create a feedback from the Earth to the machine itself. Yeah, feedback loop. Right. Yeah. But he suggested that this resonant, this mechanical resonance would propagate throughout the entire planet. Right, through the lith lithosphere. Then we would yeah. be able to study those vibrations, knowing what the input signal was... And then determine any from any position on the planet, we could look down through the planet, yeah, basically, and see what was going on in the interior of the planet. We would be able to pick up these vibrations on the ocean floor, ships. I mean, on the ocean floor, on the on the ocean itself. So yeah. ships at sea would be able to pick up messages that were sent from, yeah, from this um, vibrational. It, yeah, because it would be the carrier signal, basically. Right, yeah, it would yeah. be the carrier signal, and the Earth, since it would be in tune with the Earth. Because he was studying resonant frequencies of structures and the Earth is a structure, the idea was to tune it to a high harmonic of the Earth's resonant frequency, and then it would be sustained by the Earth itself. Once you got that harmonic ringing, yeah. the Earth would sustain it for incredible. So then your power input, it would actually turn around. The Earth would then you be could get, feeding. You could pull the power you out. You could pull the power. <clears throat> instead of putting power into the oscillator to keep the oscillator going, Eventually, you'd be able to stop putting power into the oscillator and start drawing power off of it. Yeah. So. Yeah, and and you would be able to. the The resolution of your ability to look at the interior of the planet would be basically dependent on the wavelength of whatever oscillations you were using. Right. So you could get a really if you were using a higher harmonic, you would be able to get high resolution interior planet images. Right. Basically. So if you. So if you. Let's say that one of the frequencies is one hour. If you created a resonant, if you created a, a harmonic oscillator that oscillated at one hertz, one time per second. Yeah. That would be a harmonic. Right. Right. It would yeah. be a 3,600th yeah. times the, the speed of the Earth's hum. Yeah. So you could fit, in other words, you could fit 3,600 of those waveforms, of those oscillations inside the, natural the fundamental one. natural waveform of the Earth. Yeah. <clears throat> and they would reinforce each other. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's just yeah, cool. Yeah. So anyway, that's my story. Great story. And it kind of fits with where we're going on the That's why it's topic. my story. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, what, what do we know that is a harmonic of the size of the earth that's been <laughs> yeah. built here hmm, hmm not sure <laughs> all right let's take I'm a break pretty sure it has <laughs> that's <Okay>. right <laughs> yeah all right we're gonna take a break and we'll come back for the main topic of the show so start your workout now <laughs>
Snake Bros, always seeking the pyramids. Forever and ever 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 and ever. <laughs> Can't wait to get back into this book, buddy. Oh, yeah. So I have taken copious notes. Uh, I took some copious mental notes. All right. <laughs> uh, so first thing I want to say, a couple of corrections here. Uh, it's not pilaster, it's it's pilaster, or pilaster is how I think it's pronounced. Okay. I looked it up, pilaster, because I was thinking pillar, it's probably pillar, like like banister, pilaster, yeah. but it's pilaster. Okay. Um, let's see, what else? Okay, a <clears throat> couple things I want to get into before we dive back into the book. Uh, so I was reading some of Gantenbrink's comments, right? Um, on the last show, and there's something that he said that caught my that basically caught my attention as I was reviewing the show. He says he's commenting about how why he's not been able to go back there and do more work, and he says it's a feud between believers and non-believers. What can that mean? Like what? <clears throat> What, what, who are the believers? What, what do they believe in and what do they not believe in? And who are these people that are, how, how is a feud between these people? Like, cause it sounds to me like believers and non-believers in what? Like, it, like ancient Atlantis something, you know, that's what I'm thinking. Like, what is he talking about? And how is a feud between these people the reason why, you know, he's being called to speculate and being told he can't go back to Egypt? So I just found that interesting. Like, in other words, it, it to me, it may hint. Yeah, I realized I'm just now that I have been making assumptions about that statement that I don't actually know are true. It's like my assumptions were that the the non-believers would have been, you know, the the scriptards, the standard model. Yeah, that's what I think too. But it doesn't make any sense, really. I just what do they non believe Exactly. And who are the believers that are feuding with those guys? That unless he's reason. talking about the scientific method. Yeah, could be. But that requires an assumption on my part to think. Yeah. That's what it's about. So right. yeah, it's a good question. A, yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, I've got a bunch of notes here, but not all of them are for. Okay. Uh. So let's let's go over this. Uh, uh, I had some confusion with Campbell's chamber and so on and so forth. Yes. Right. <clears throat> so I looked this up, guys. <laughs> so here, Davidson's chamber was the first one, right? So the king's chamber, and then directly above that is Davidson's chamber. Yeah. That's the one that Davidson found. Okay. The next one up is called Wellington's chamber. The one above that is Nelson's chamber. The one above that is Lady Abathnot's chamber. And then Campbell's chamber is the one on the very top. Okay. <clears throat> so Davison's chamber is the one that has zero marks. Yeah. And he's the guy who Found precariously it. constructed a system of ladders in the Grand Gallery. He he heard a strange echo in the Grand Gallery At and the then top of it, yeah. lit up a candle went, and then climbed up there and climbed through the bat dung twenty five feet or whatever, twenty five meters. Yeah. Until he ended up in the first one, which is I find that really strange yeah what type of door is at the top of the grand gallery why is this not in diagrams right what yeah. does that doorway look like right is it intentional what type of s system did he crawl through yeah was it cut into it or was yeah. it part of the masonry there's right. a lot of questions around that yeah um I want to go there. Yeah. <laughs> Woo, I want to go there. So <laughs> so Davison's Chamber, Wellington's Chamber. So I, I, the way I look at it is Davison's Chamber is named after him. The next four are named after British royalty by Vyz, I assume. Remember, because uh, he makes, th makes this discovery, blasts his way through, and then royalty is coming to visit Egypt that's and he right. takes them on a tour, and he names these new found chambers after what the people. What a he's, shyster. I know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So this is Wellington's chambers, Sir Wellington, right? And he's, he's bringing them up there and then naming the chambers after them. As he, Yeah, yeah. This is classic. Anyway. Give me more money. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I've totally found stuff. I promise, guys. Um, uh. So I found that, that information with the diagram with the names on Graham Hancock's website, uh, an article by Scott Creighton. Crichton? 
Creighton about the uh, which is a very good article where he's questioning the veracity of the uh, cartouches in those chambers. Hancock uh, is or the or the no, guy no, that wrote the article. So Ra- Hancock has a monthly author. Yes, yes, right, uh, author of the month, whatever, and he and they post a big article on there. So Creighton Scott made this article. I think it was in 2018 where he's basically going through and he's showing you images of the cartouches what they look like and how they're flipped over and even if you turn them around like people are he's like so the argument is you got to flip them over and then they're right but they're he's like showing you that they're still wrong the numbers are off they don't work right and anyway yeah good good article and it has a diagram showing the king's chamber with all the top ones and they're they're labeled and named cool so uh okay i have other notes here but they yeah, are and vice actually was the guy who blasted up above Davidson's chamber to all the ones above that. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. They first tried using their hardened steel chisels, chisels to, against the granite, against the granite and <laughs> realized that that does not work. <laughs> so they went and got copper chisels with stone hammers and they were able to get up there. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh, yeah. One more thing. The uh, <clears throat> the book starts uh, Giza Power Plant by Christopher Dunn, which everyone should purchase, by the way, and read. It starts, and we read this, starts with the secret digging conspiracy. Yep. Okay. And I was looking at the timeline here, and they're talking about there's there's articles and, and interviews where people are speculating that someone is secretly trying to dig to, to get behind the door that Gantenbrink discovered yes. a couple of years before. And I started to wonder if... That was a so this is my conspiracy guy coming out again, but I'm thinking, yeah, they dug back there and blocked it off so that when they tunneled through later with the thing. All oh, this- my God. <laughs> <laughs> my shit. conspiracy guy is because it's oh, a well honed <laughs> conspiracy guy. Uh, OK, other notes here, but those will come up later. So. Kyle was correct. I s- completely skipped the well shaft stuff. Um, and when I went, so when I went back to check it out, I remembered why. And it's because you have to mark so much to really get it. And I was trying not to read everything from chapter one and two and three. I went back over the well shaft stuff twice as yeah. well. So, okay. But I did mark it. So I'm hoping Chris Dunn won't notice that I'm pretty much reading the entire first three chapters of his book by doing it later. <laughs> All right, guys, just well, keep, keep this a secret, guys. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I, I also need to say that that I had this idea messed up that I was thinking Dunn was sort of supporting the idea of the guardians, the guardians going in and looking at all this stuff. And and that's not what's actually right. happening in the book. He that's somebody else's opinion that Dunn basically. Yeah. He's like <laughs> destroys it. <laughs> yeah. So. OK, so here we go. After Europeans started to travel to Egypt, information regarding the wonders found there began to find an audience in Western civilization. Fueled by their own curiosity and this intense interest at home, European tr- explorers in the area were quite energetic in studying, searching, and noting just about anything, no matter how seemingly insignificant, pertaining to the Great Pyramid. As one researcher followed another, more knowledge of this pyramid was uncovered and revealed to the world. John Greaves, a British mathematics teacher and astronomer, visited the Great Pyramid in 1638. He made studies in which he hoped to find information establishing the dimensions of the planet. During his explorations, Greaves discovered what was to be known as the well shaft. The well shaft is located at the bottom of the Grand Gallery through an opening in the west wall and is approximately three feet wide. The notches cut into the sides enabled Greaves to lower himself into the bat-infested bowels of the pyramid. Climbing down, Greaves reached a level that was 60 feet below the level of the Grand Gallery. Here he came across a small round chamber cut into the limestone bedrock. Beyond this small cavern and deeper still, the shaft continued downward. Not knowing what lay beneath him or whether a bottomless pit might swallow him up, Greaves dropped a lighted flare down the hole. He noted that the flare continued to flicker from the depths and assumed that the shaft terminated at that point. Deciding that he had crawled around enough for one day, Greaves made his way out into the fresh air, leaving the stifling shaft to its resident bats. (laughs) 
This discovery left Greaves extremely puzzled, for the well shaft did not seem to serve any purpose. The cavern, which is now known as the grotto, was equally perplexing. It seemed pointless to Greaves to dig a shaft to nowhere and enlarge a part of the shaft into a grotto. This perplexity affected later explorers as well. In 1765, that's over 100 years later, uh, Nathaniel Davison, while vacationing in Egypt, was able to carefully explore the Great Pyramid. Going farther than Greaves, Davison was lowered by rope another 100 feet below the level of the grotto. Here he encountered a blockage in the shaft. Why anyone would go to the trouble of digging a shaft with no apparent purpose or destination almost 200 feet into the heart of the pyramid was a mystery to Davison. A part of this mystery was to be solved when G.B. Caviglia, the Italian captain of a Maltese ship flying the British ensign. <laughs> <laughs> Confusing much, guy? Italian Malti... Uh, from Malta, too. Hmm. This guy knows. It's interesting as well that this original guy, whatever his name was, was like, I want to go Greece. see if I can discover the dimensions of the Earth right. by studying the pyramid. Yeah. Why? Because he could have. I know, but how did he already know Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> he is, uh, he's part of some secret club. Yes. Caviglia was determined to shed some light on the mystery of the well, and after being lowered past the level of the grotto by some Egyptian helpers, he attempted to clear the blockage that Davison had encountered before him. The blockage appeared to be just loose sand and rock, and so Caviglia filled baskets with the debris and had helpers raise the baskets up and out of the shaft. He could not persuade them to work for, I mean, like, he, okay, so he's like 160 feet down. Right. And they're trying, God. He could not persuade the helpers to work for long because the air became so foul with clouds of dust and the stench of bat dung that the men were about to suffocate. Caviglia burned chunks of sulfur in an attempt to purify the air, but this ploy did not impress his helpers who refused to continue working. Apparently, Dunn says later that burning chunks of sulfur in, uh, in caves that had bad air was a thing that they did that they thought yeah. helped purify it. Well, it, yes. Does it work? It kills bacteria, basically. Mm. So That's it, right. We use it in the barrels. In the wine barrels, yeah. right? And that's been that's been done since, you know, Roman times at least. Uh, they, they found that burning sulfur candles in the barrels would keep the barrels from going bad. Okay. But, but doesn't does it, necessarily... Does it, ki- does it help them from, like, does it make them not bad after they've already gone bad? <laughs> It will kill the bacteria, okay, right? right? Now, but it won't kill um, spores, right? Histoplasmosis or yeah, whatever, you know, in the in bla- bat stuff, yeah, in the bat dung. Mm. Mm. Can't kill spores. Still determined to find some reason for the shaft, Caviglia decided to clear the descending passage down to the subterranean pit. Uh, uh, Al Mamoon's men had used this passage as a, as a dumping ground when they were cutting around the plugs that filled the ascending passage. So he decides to go around and like the, the descending passage was clogged at the bottom too. Right. He's like, all right, let's check the descending passage because we know that's clogged. So he's like, let's clear this. It's easier than raising baskets up by a rope. You still are crouch crawling through a, you know, or yeah. whatever. Maybe, but you can, at least you can drag sleds or something. Uh, okay. So with his helpers back on the job and carrying the chippings out of the pyramid, Caviglia slowly and painfully inched his way downward. His extreme discomfort was eventually rewarded when he discovered a low doorway on the west side of the passage. Through this doorway, a hole bored upward into the heart of the pyramid. The smell of sulfur was evident inside the doorway, and Caviglia deduced that perhaps this smell was from the sulfur he had previously been burning. Digging upward, Caviglia and his workers, with limestone chips and dust showering down on them, finally broke through into the well shaft, thereby completing the connection between the lower parts of the descending passage and the Grand Gallery. Caviglia, like Greaves and Davison before him, was still faced with the same questions. Who dug the well? When was the well dug? And why? Another aspect of this same mystery, which further increased his perplexity, is that from the junction of the Grand Gallery and the horizontal passage down to the level of the bedrock, it appears that the well shaft actually had been included in the original plans for the construction of the pyramid. From the level of the Grand Gallery down to the bedrock... The walls of the well shaft are symmetrical in their construction, and although they do not have the precise fine finish that is evident in other passages and chambers, their features do not resemble those of a tunnel cut as an afterthought through solid masonry, such as the forced passage dug by Al-Mamun. 
It has been speculated that this shaft was dug by grave robbers who broke into the pyramid to strip it of its treasures. This theory has been refuted by some who have debated whether or not a band of thieves would have the knowledge, perception, or sheer luck to dig a blind passage with such accuracy that it would eventually meet with the Grand Gallery, which is only a few feet wide. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so you, you climb down to the bottom of the descending passage and then you dig upwards for like hundred and almost 200 feet and manage to hit the Grand Gallery right at the horizontal passage, which goes into the Queen's Chamber, which is where the well shaft starts on the west side of the Grand Gallery or whatever. How did all that debris get down there? Yeah. Uh, well, I, yeah, I don't know. That's that's weird. It's like they're they're digging the well shaft and they're throwing the debris down into the descending passage. Yeah. And then as they get up far enough, what do they do? Stop moving the stuff out, or did they start digging from the top down? Yeah. And that's where the grotto is, is where they connected the two tunnels. <laughs> so they met each other in the middle. Sort of, somewhere. almost. Yeah, and had to kind of widen out the little make a room there. Ooh, that's a hard question. Because that would assume that they got into the Grand Gallery before digging the well shaft. Exactly. No. Right. No, nope. And we know they didn't do that because they would have been moving those granite so then, plugs. So, so again, how did the debris end up in the well shaft? Yeah. Going up the column up the of the column. well shaft. Like you had because to have. Because Alma Moon was dumping it down the descending passage. It wouldn't have been stacking no, up in the well have. shaft. Right. That's what I'm saying. So it had to have come from above. From above, yeah. How like did they, they get were, out? Like they were tunneling and dumping their waste down into the subterranean chamber and eventually it stacks all the way up until it starts to fill the well shaft as they're way up high how do they get out yeah then then they're trapped you're right this is this is an enigma <laughs> this makes no sense it makes zero sense in contradiction to the grave robbery theory david uh, david davison a structural engineer from leeds in the north of england developed a scenario of prehistoric events that, in his mind, met the demands of logic and common sense, and at the same time explains the existence of the well shaft. Davison. Okay, this is Davidson. So the other guy is Davison. Right. Now we're talking about David Davidson. Davidson. Yes. Uh, Davidson, after spending several months studying the pyramid, felt that the Great Pyramid was not originally intended for the use of the people who built it, or their king. Rather, it was designed to be used as a quote-unquote time capsule in which knowledge would be preserved for the benefit of a future civilization. In a professional capacity, he also maintained that the plugs inside the ascending passage were positioned as the level of the pyramid grew higher. According to Davidson, to have slid them down the passage without them jamming in the process would have been an unlikely feat, as the clearances at the side of the passage would not have been sufficient to allow them to pass freely. Davidson's scenario was set shortly after the Great Pyramid was built, or not many generations after, before knowledge of the design of the interior was lost. He theorized that following a violent earthquake or some other equally devastating occurrence, the guardians of the Great Pyramid noticed some subsidence, uh, subsidence. subsidence yeah. effects of the structure on the outside. Fearing that the king's chamber might also might have suffered from the disturbance, they decided to enter the pyramid to investigate. To do this, they started to dig upward near the bottom of the descending passage. Davidson explained that instead of taking a possible shorter route, such as taken by Alba Moon at the later date, the Guardians chose their route so that they could inspect two large fissures in the bedrock of the Descending Passage. Although these fissures can be seen in the Descending Passage, what knowledge did the Guardians of the Pyramid have that assured them that the unseen portion of the fissures followed a predictable direction? Would they have been able to plot the course of their tunnel with assurance that as they bored through the limestone bedrock, they would cross the same fissures at two points? Without this assurance, would such a difficult and time-consuming project be undertaken? That's a good question. Yeah. Because even if you know the fit, like somehow assuming you are from the outside of the pyramid, you can see, okay, something weird has happened and you go in there and you're like, there's cracks at the descending passage. How would you know that those cracks would lead you eventually to the, the Grand Gallery. Unless they had some serious, like, technological device that was able to yeah, look if at... if the whole thing is vibrating and you can kind of read the interior of the structure yeah. using those vibrations. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go up here and see if we need to hand smear some plaster in these <laughs> cracks. Right. <laughs> but uh, are you going to do keep going on that where he kind of takes this idea apart yeah so well I, let's see what else i marked here uh it seems obvious that those who knew the interior design of the pyramid dug the shaft 
Considering the amount of work di involved in digging it, the well shaft that connects the descending passage with the lower portion of the Grand Gallery must have been a part of the original design of the pyramid and served a specific purpose for its builders. Nevertheless, Davidson's theory is given the benefit of the doubt by Peter Tompkins, who says, quote, There is nothing inherently illogical about this version of events. It would have been no easy job to tunnel upwards through the solid rock and various courses of masonry. Altogether, hundreds of tons of material would have had to have been chipped away and taken out of the pyramid up the descending passage, but it would have not, it would not have been impossible. So he's saying that they were taking at least some of it out. Right. It is absurd, uh, uh, and that's unquote. Okay, so it is absurd to propose that this feature of the Great Pyramid exists through the efforts of tomb robbers who were bl digging blindly on the chance that they might discover a burial chamber. The physical demands are monumental. Digging upward, the workers would be contending with a small, cramped, almost vertical tunnel in which they would need physical support, light, and oxygen. As they hacked away at the face of their board, the air would be heavily laden with limestone dust and fragments would be falling on them and the workers below. The sheer human effort would have been daunting as hundreds of tons of chips were wrestled up the descending passage and removed from the pyramid. Wrestled up? Oh, up the descending passage. Yeah. yeah. Not, not up the well shaft. Not up the well shaft, right. Easily taken down the well shaft. Right. Dropped gravity. down the well shaft and then <laughs> some of them at least dragged out of the descending passage all the way out of the pyramid, presumably. Yeah. Uh, okay, so now he's quoting. Let's see. He says, I find the observations of Petrie more agreeable and likely. He cast doubt on the intentions of the builders as interpreted by uh, Mara Gioglio, Rinaldi, and Edwards. He said, so Petrie says, the shaft, or well, leading from the north end of the gallery down to the subterranean parts was either not contemplated at first or else was forgotten in the course of the building. The proof of this is that it has been cut through the masonry after the courses were completed. Upon examining the shaft, it is found to be irregularly torturous through the masonry and without any arrangement of the blocks to suit it. While in more than one place, a corner of a block may be seen left in the irregular curved side of the shaft, all the rest of the block having disappeared in the cutting of the shaft. Right. So if you have a, if you have a square shaped block, they took out the entire block and there's like still one tiny corner piece still stuck right, in the side. Right, because the tunnel is round. There's like a little bit of the corner left right. up on the upper part or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's a great observation. You know that that it was done after, after the courses the were laid down. Yeah. It was cut through the masonry after. Right. Uh, okay. This is a conclusive point since it would never have been built so at first. A similar feature is at the mouth of the passage in the gallery. Here, the sides of the mouth are very well cut, quite as good work as the dressing of the gallery walls. But on the south side, there is a vertical joint in the gallery side, only 5.3 inches from the mouth. Now, great care is always taken in the pyramid to put large stones at corners. And it is quite inconceivable that a pyramid builder would put a mere slip 5.3 inches thick beside the opening to a passage. Yeah. So instead of having a lintel over the opening, there's actually a vertical joint in the middle of the opening. Yeah. Yeah. There's a tiny little thin block on the side on one side of the opening of the shaft that's only five point three inches right. thick. And he's like, no, they made their corner blocks big yeah. of any of any uh, you know entrance. So he's saying that the, the workmanship is good. It's a square cut. It's not like a round which, board hole, but it's makes it, still not original. Yeah, but this makes it unlikely to be tomb robbers, quote unquote tomb robbers. Right, because it's well done. Yeah. Yeah. Why, mm -hmm. and, and that's that's similar to a lot of things that they did where, like, for example, Ganton Briggs' door. Like, right before you get to that door, it all starts to become really <laughs> nicely done. Yeah. But yeah. then on the way there, it's kind <laughs> yeah, of just rough and yeah. <clears throat> and it also, so this makes me think that they got in a hurry. If, uh, let's say that they were digging down from the Grand Gallery, right? They start up there because that's where it's real nice. Like while they're still building up, maybe. No, like I'm saying, well, maybe, well, I'm thinking that like they cut this in after long after the pyramid had been built for some reason. As they're working their way down, for whatever reason, they start going faster and faster and faster and start and stop worrying about making it look nice for uh -huh. whatever reason. Because it, it becomes sort of round and irregular, and they're just tearing through the masonry as quickly as possible. But in the gallery, it's a nice square cut. Yeah. Yeah. Like they got in a hurry. But again, or they just stopped caring. Again, <clears throat> they would have had, they couldn't dig down 
Unless there's another entrance into the Grand Gallery. You're right. You're right. They couldn't have. That, there has to be some other way to get in because it was blocked off completely. Yeah. Unless maybe they, there. Maybe there is a way to get in. Maybe they have a service tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> Or if you know the right note, you get up to those granite plugs and you go, Woo, and they go, <laughs> right? And they get out of your way. <laughs> uh, it evidently shows that the passage mouth was cut out after the building was finished in that part. It is clear then that the whole of this shaft is an additional feature to the first plan. Unquote. Petrie also noticed a large block of granite at the level of the grotto. The block was positioned as though it had been pushed aside from the vertical section of the shaft. What is this block of, doing, of granite doing down a shaft which in many minds had nothing to do with the original design of the pyramid? After tunneling through virgin rock and reaching the level of the Grand Gallery, why would anyone decide to drop a block of granite down the well? This would take considerable effort. Where did they get the granite? There has to be a reason for it being there. And I agree with that. There's this, like, I've seen pictures of it. In the, in the grotto, there's this precariously balanced block of granite. Like, over the, the next part of the descending part of the well. It's sort of, like, right there on the edge. How heavy is this block? It's a pretty big block, and it's got holes bored through it on one part. So it occurred to me that... Some people thought it was part of the quote-unquote portcullis system, but why did it get all, how did it get all the way down into the... <laughs> How did it get all the way down into the grotto? And the pharaoh was like, <laughs> just woke up. No, I'm not <laughs> dead yet. <laughs> I'm not quite dead. I think I'll go for a walk. <laughs> no, I was thinking that I'm, I'm still stumped on how all of this material got into the shaft in the bottom. Because you couldn't have done that yeah. tunneling upward and then gotten back out. You're right. And if there is another way to get out, then they would have come in that way. Unless there's another purpose for the shaft, but why would what type of shaft that has a purpose would they leave a bunch of rubble in the bottom of? Yeah. So then I thought, well, maybe they were backing their way out. They put a granite block, and the grotto. The purpose of the grotto was to put a bunch of debris up there, and use the granite block as some sort of with holes bored in it with a rope or something. Oh, that they, when the they get to the falling when they get to the bottom, they pull the trap door, which is the granite block, withholding oh. all of this debris, and then it all tumbles down and closes <laughs> off the bottom of the chamber. The bottom of the That's tunnel. a pretty good idea, except that it's still there. Well yeah, I mean whatever it was doing was holding all of the stuff to keep it from falling down. Yeah. Until they got out. Hmm. How where did they get it though? Well they brought it up there. Oh. From the from outside. Oh, right? okay. They took it down the descending passage. They they hauled it up. Holy crap! I mean, these guys build pyramids, bro. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's no big deal. Yeah. <laughs> Truth. Truth. Yeah, I don't know. This whole well shaft. That's what I'm giant. saying. This is one of the most fascinating parts <laughs> of the book to me, aside from the from the power plant idea. It's yeah. just what is going on with this well shaft. <laughs> Who put that there? Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's take a break. Okay. And we'll come back for the second half of the show and continue on this well shaft mystery. than we were at the end of the last show. <laughs> we have actually degressed. <laughs> but we have to we have to go, to go through this well shaft stuff, so but yeah, we are we have gone backwards in the in the pursuit of this pyramid. Uh, so these names are hard for me to say, but I think it's Marachioglio. Is that right? Look at that name. Renal I know this is Rinaldi and Edwards, and I think that might might be I've heard this said, but I can't remember how it's pronounced. But these I don't know. Just just say it kind of like an olive tree, you know, Mariolo. <laughs> Mar yeah, Mar <laughs> Mariolo. Rinaldi and Edward and Petrie's observations can be reconciled by proposing that the 
constructed portion of the whale shaft was originally smaller than it is now and was enlarged to allow passage into the Grand Gallery for inspection, for inspecting the damage in the king's chamber. So this is done talking now. Mm -hmm. He's thinking that they enlarged something that was already there. That's what I was, uh, I was talking about that last time. Like, what right. if it was a shaft similar to the Queen's? And so you imagine, like the Queen's chamber shafts, there's a block of limestone that's fairly thin in front of the opening of this shaft. They know it's there. Yeah. So they take that block out, Yeah. which leaves a joint in the Grand Gallery that's yeah. not I think it proper. would, well, based on his, because I've finished the book now, and based on the way he thinks the well shaft and all that stuff worked originally, it would probably have been open, because that was for the draining of the, uh, okay. right? So yeah, but they basically there's this little bitty eight by eight inch whatever, and they like we got to crawl through here and check right. some cracks. And, there, and there's a portion of it where that big granite block was actually built in, built in yeah. as something, some purpose inside that shaft. Yeah, and they right. had to when they got to it, they had to move, open up a hole around it to and move then, it out of the way. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so that's kind of cool, but it still doesn't answer the question of the debris. That's right. And how did they get back out and all that stuff? Yeah. Okay, so. These observations can be reconciled by proposing, yeah, that the well shaft was originally smaller and then enlarged. If this is true, then perhaps the well shaft was designed not for human access, but for something else. Whatever this purpose was, perhaps it was, perhaps it called for the inclusion of a large granite block within the passage to serve a specific function. These are questions I will answer later in this book. If the well shaft had been dug by grave robbers, they would have needed to know the internal arrangement of the pyramid and be sufficiently inspired by what was contained within it to undertake this project. As for the inspection theory, we might ask, how were the guardians able to discern any uh, subsidence on the outside of the pyramid? And then he goes on to say, with an error of only seven eighths of an inch over the entire 13 acre base, over, over a distance of one foot, the amount of, amount of error would be only 0 0.001 inch, which is less than half the thickness of a human hair. But I have a possibility here that I thought about when I was listening, going back through some of this stuff. And that is that if you assume, and we know that, that, the, that the pyramid was originally encased in beautiful, smooth, flat limestone blocks, it may have been easy to see a slight deviation in that casing mm -hmm. from the okay. outside. You might have been able to look up there and be like, okay, we got a problem. Because like even a tiniest deviation in that smooth, beautiful surface would have been noticeable across a 13-acre you know, width base. That's, yeah. Hmm. So yeah, I with, the, with the rough exterior, now it you would be You can't tell difficult. anything. But with, if it was just beautiful, smooth, you would be like, okay, we got a problem. Right. There's a... You would there's see, a lump of up yeah. There. There's a lump. There's a corner. There's a, yeah. something that wasn't there right. before. There's yeah. an edge. Yeah, you can pick up. Well, go go inspect the pyramid every equinox. <laughs> That's right. You, you shall see, see if there yeah. are any cracks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my idea for that. Uh, That's good. That's okay. Good. So he said. Dunn says, nonetheless, evidence indicates that an inspection of the inside chambers of the Great Pyramid was conducted in antiquity, and repairs were made. For example, plaster was daubed on the cracks of the ceiling beams above the king's chamber. But what triggered the guardian's concern for this chamber? If they were to initiate a close inspection of the internal passages and chambers of the Great Pyramid following an earthquake, wouldn't the descending passage satisfy their curiosity and put their minds at ease? It would seem that the penetration of the internal chambers of the pyramid was prompted not by the detection of minute uh, subsidence on the outside, but by other observations of the pyramid's form and function. Okay. That is the end of the red marks I made, which is the stuff I missed last time. So let's move forward here. Uh, You're in uh, chapter four now, right? Or, or yeah, well, we three. we stopped uh, in chapter three. Yeah, chapter three. Yeah, okay. Chapter three: precision unparalleled. So. After reading considerable material on the subject of the Great Pyramid and studying the drawings that accompanied the texts, it appeared to me that the opponents of the tomb theory had a valid point. With this in mind, I looked more closely at what I considered to be the most significant information regarding the Great Pyramid, which was the accuracy with which it was built. It soon became obvious to me that the researchers on both sides of the issue were sympathetic to the craftspeople involved in building the pyramids, but the researchers were not craftspeople themselves, and they did not have the perspective gained through years of experience working with their hands and with machinery. Having that experience myself, I have some very strong opinions regarding the level of manufacturing expertise 
practiced by the ancient Egyptians. They were not primitive by any means, and their craftsmanship and precision would be an extreme challenge to duplicate today. For readers not familiar with the issues of manufacturing, let me pause briefly to provide a short historical overview. The Industrial Revolution, which had its genesis in England in the early 1800s, brought about standardization in the manufacture of components. Take, for instance, the rifle. At one time, each part of a rifle was manufactured and individually tailored to fit another part. There was no standardization of precision whereby interchangeable pieces could be taken off the shelf and appropriately fitted into the rifle without some adjustment. Each component was customized to fit with any other. Eli Whitney first proposed standardizing rifle components in order to facilitate supplies for war. However, in order to achieve standardization, unwelcome variations had to be worked out of the manufacturing process. In other words, it would be very unlikely that a shaft produced on a lathe that machined variations of 0 point, or, uh, 0.01 inch in diameter would precision fit a bore with the same variations. Machines with greater precision were needed along with a system of measurement that was standardized and closely controlled to monitor the products produced by these machines. Metrology is the science of the use of measuring equipment that, that is closely calibrated and monitored. The equipment requires a greater degree of precision than the object that is being produced. Okay. That's right. That's a good point there. That being the case, we are assured that the object conforms to its specification. Normally, a measuring instrument or gauge for checking the precision of a product has a tolerance of 10% of the tolerance of the object. Hmm. Although, the, so if you, if you had a tolerance of one inch, you would need a gauge that had a tolerance of one tenth of an inch in order right. to check it properly. Although the accuracy exhibited in the Great Pyramid was recorded over a century ago, it would be helpful to reevaluate the findings of early, early explorers in the light of today's technology. Yeah. When Petrie made his critical measurements of the Great Pyramid casing stones in 1882, he was astounded by what he found. Quote, The eastern joint of the northern casing stones is on the top 0 0.20, 0 .002, uh, 0.045 wide, and on the face, so he's got a bunch of numbers here, very small numbers. Hence, the mean thickness of the joints is 0 0.020 inches. So, uh, two-tenths, right? No, two-hundredths of an inch is the variation there. Right. And therefore, the mean variation of the cutting of the stone from a straight line and from a true square is but uh, one one-hundredth of an inch on the length of 75 inches up the face, an amount of accuracy equal to most modern opticians' straight edges of such length, unquote. Petrie's close examination of the casing stones revealed variations so minute that they were barely discernible to the naked eye. The records show that the outer casing blocks were square and flat, with a mean variation of one one hundredth of an inch over an area of 35 square feet. Oh my God. Fitted together, the blocks maintained a gap of zero to one fiftieth of an inch, which might be compared to the thickness of a fingernail. Inside this gap was cement that bonded the limestone so firmly that the strength of the joint was greater than the limestone itself. The composition of this cement has been a mystery for years. Oh my God. The casing blocks were reported to weigh between 16 and 20 tons each, with the largest blocks measuring five feet high, 12 feet long, and eight feet deep. God, <laughs> this is ridiculous. And they're bringing them all the way to the top, too. <laughs> <laughs> This is why I'm saying I've always thought that the casing had to have been put on from the top down. You know, it's like paint for one thing. If you if you're if you do it from the bottom up, let's say you get two thirds of the way up and then somebody drops a block and it just scrapes all the way down your beautiful, smooth casing on the outside. It's like you paint from the top down. Right. So they built a step pyramid and then they they cut the insides of the casing stones. Yeah. And then you start putting them step on to stand on the stair steps. Could be. Yeah. Could be, yeah, you're right. You could have done it from the bottom up. You just had to have been extremely careful. Or it was just easy. Right. Or they smoothed them off with a chamois after they were done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, get the pyramid planer. <laughs> Got the casing stones on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the fact that those casing stones are still at the top of the second pyramid makes me think that... Because if they were put in from the bottom up and they were... They were standing each on each other, each other right. that they would have all they would come down. But the right. fact that they're still up there. Yeah, that's a good point. You they're, know, they're self-supporting. They're self-supporting. Well, 
the the pyramid supports each one independently. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it was these figures that greatly influenced my preliminary assessment of the pyramid. Here was a prehistoric monument that was constructed with such precision that you could not find a comparable modern building. More remarkable to me was that the builders evidently found it necessary to maintain a standard of precision that can be found today in machine shops, but certainly not on building sites. Yeah. Like it's it's one thing to like machine a part in a machine shop, like a like a piston or so, for example, that has these tiny tolerances, but to build a thirteen acre base structure that has those same tolerances is ridiculous. Yeah, <laughs> planet piston. Right. <laughs> Although the exact precision demonstrated in the manufacture and assembly of the Great Pyramid may have had little significance a century ago. There are, at this time, many people who are intimately familiar with these dimensional tolerances. I am one of them, for many years creating products with tolerances much finer than one one-hundredth of an inch. I know what it takes to hold such fine tolerances, and there is a great difference between knowing what one one-hundredth of an inch is from an abstract academic viewpoint and understanding what one one-hundredth of an inch is from a hands-on practical experience. Yes. This is why I laugh when I hear intelligent men and women proposing that the pyramids and other artifacts were created using hammers and chisels. Other machinists, tool makers, and engineers with whom I have discussed this issue are equally amused and normally just shake their heads and mutter something straightforward and unprintable. <laughs> <laughs> These workers, the members of what we consider a highly advanced civilization, understand the following. It is very well to dream to speculate and theorize. But when it comes to doing the work, we are generally brought down to earth and hard facts. The most efficient and economically minded designers and engineers are those who have experienced the manufacturing phase of their ideas and have worked on the bench and with the machines. These experiences lead them to be more realistic in their demands of skilled craftspeople. Yep. <clears throat> like GMA, right? He knows not to make ridiculous demands of people who are working with lathes because he works with lathes. Right. <laughs> Through my own experience in manufacturing, I have realized that the theories and ideas that seemed to work fine in my mind or on paper could be rendered unworkable when I actually tried to apply them. In much the same way, I have found that many theories regarding the building of the Great Pyramid are not supported with material proof for no one, despite numerous attempts, has been able to duplicate the structure using the methods theorized to have been in place in ancient Egypt. These methods have been applied with limited success in building smaller structures, but they are not attempts to replicate the most difficult aspects of the building. Yeah, there's that axiom again. Right. A pyramid that is 20 or 50 feet tall and built with limestone blocks that weigh no more than two tons does not explain how the ancient pyramid builders raised 70 ton blocks of granite to a height of 200 feet. Scaling up a project does not necessarily follow a linear path. Yeah, this is a point you've been making for years. Yeah. <laughs> Nor does it rely solely on a fixed set of assumptions. So the researcher's 50 foot pyramid may not necessarily provide them with all the data necessary to calculate the requirements for building the Great Pyramid. Again, let us look to a technology common to our own generation to present an example of using the wrong assumptions when scaling up a project. Take, for instance, the early development of industrial lasers. As physicists, electrical engineers, optical engineers, and mechanical engineers accomplished the development of high-powered industrial lasers, they made an assumption that because the laser did not apply any mechanical force to the workpiece, the machine did not have to be as sturdy as those used in conventional machining operations, such as milling or lathe turning, where tremendous mechanical forces exert pressure on the tool and the machine. Right, so because they're saying, well, if we're using just a beam of light to do the cutting, it doesn't have to be as strong as the thing that holds the drill bit that has to right. press down, right? Working in the laboratory with machine members or stages no longer than 12 inches, researchers proved this assumption correct. However, when they built a machine that was three or four times larger, they found that other forces, such as inertia, came into play, and they realized that the machine tools that carried these lasers had to be equally as robust and strong as conventional machines. The situation in which Egyptologists would find themselves, I believe, would be quite similar if they scaled up their demonstration pyramid to the dimensions and precision of the Great Pyramid. Yep. 
Yeah, you can't scale this stuff at a li- like he said it perfectly. It doesn't scale linearly. People who spend their entire careers building things either on a building site or in a manufacturing tool shop will know of several ways to do a task. An Egyptologist's attempt to build a pyramid using primitive means may be experimental archaeology, but because it is based on a technologically limited insight into the real significance of the Great Pyramid, it is not scientific. It only proves that what the research has accomplished can be accomplished in the manner it was accomplished and nothing more. If it if they're successful if they in actually, accomplishment, yeah. Right. If they accomplished, well, yeah. well, whatever they accomplished, yeah. they proved that they could do that the right. way they did it. Yeah, but that doesn't mean that that's how it was done. That doesn't mean that's how the Great Pyramid was right. done. Right, yeah. and especially because it doesn't scale. So he says, I applaud Dr. Mark Laner's honesty in confessing that he had used steel tools and a front end loader while building the demonstration pyramid for the WGBH Nova documentary called This Old Pyramid. I wonder, though, why that construction effort was cut from the film and we viewers never got to see it. Mm -hmm. The most refreshing account of the talent possessed by the builders of the Great Pyramid can be seen in a video produced by by Atlantis Rising video. An interview with respected builder and architect James Hagen, who designed the Walt Disney Shopping Village in Lake uh, Lake Buena Vista, Florida, the concrete Sanford Stadium at the University of Georgia and the impressive Marta Five Points Central Station in Atlanta reveals an architectural genius of modern times who uses every technique available for modern structures, yet is humbled by the creation of the Great Pyramid. Without pride or arrogance, his humility was combined with awe as he afforded the builders of the Great Pyramid the highest accolade one professional can bestow on another. Quote, the Egyptians... Or whoever built the pyramid, he said earnestly in his southern drawl, they could build anything they want to. (laughs) His comment becomes more significant when it is understood within the context he set forth, admitting that it would be impossible to build a great pyramid today using modern building methods and therefore impossible by primitive methods. The thing I am concerned about, he said, are the elements of the construction and how they came to be. These are the principles I am involved with in my world. And these are the principles I apply to the Great Pyramid. The precision built into the pyramid puzzled him. He doesn't understand why this kind of precision would be necessary. Modern buildings do not require that kind of accuracy, so there is no reason to do it. So why, he mused, did they try to accomplish it is the first mystery. Yep, why did they do it? His hands-on real-world experience is bolstered by an innocent sincerity and respect that transcends the plethora of amateurs, compared to him, who profess to know how the pyramids of Egypt were built and his credible support for those who still see a mystery in this edifice and who are still seeking answers. People who haven't explained anything yet, basically, is what he's talking about. (laughs) (laughs) Regarding the measurements taken by early explorers at the Great Pyramid and the possibility of duplicating this structure while maintaining similar tolerances, tolerances throughout... The many craftspeople with whom I have discussed these details disavow the primitive construction methods that Egyptologists propose. In my research, I had the opportunity to question modern stonecutters and find out the tolerances that they work with. For instance, Indiana is famous for its limestone quarries. There are approximately 33 of them in and around Bedford, and they have a long history of providing limestone for many famous buildings, most notably New York's Empire State and the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. At one time, I lived 60 miles from Bedford. So one day, I took an easy and pleasant drive through the picturesque southern Indiana countryside, which was ablaze with fall foliage, to talk to Tom Adams, who at that time worked at one of the quarries. Adams worked in the shop, cutting and dressing the stone, and the accuracy he was required to maintain in his work was not as stringent as for those who work with machine tools. Any craftspersons in a tool shop or machine shop can tell you exactly the tolerances they are working to. I asked Adams about the tolerances they work to in the quarries. He answered, pretty close. (laughs) I asked, how close is pretty close? He responded, "Uh, about a quarter of an inch. Adams was astounded to hear that the limestone in the Great Pyramid was cut to one one hundredth of an inch of tolerance. (laughs) His response regarding the abilities of the pyramid builders confirmed my belief that contrary to what we have been taught, the pyramid, pyramid builders were not primitive workers of stone. It goes without saying 
that if we were to build a Great Pyramid today, we would need a lot of patience. In preparation for his book, uh, 552000 Ice, The Ultimate Disaster, Richard Noon, or Noone, I don't know how to say it, asked Merle Booker, the technical director of the Indiana Limestone Institute of America, to prepare a time study of what it would take to quarry, fabricate, and ship enough limestone to duplicate the Great Pyramid. Using the most modern quarrying equipment available for cutting, lifting, and transporting the stone, Booker estimated that the present-day Indiana limestone industry would need to first triple its output, and then it would take the entire industry, which, as I have said, includes 33 quarries, 27 years to fill the order. <clears throat> for 131,467,940 cubic feet of stone. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear that again. 131,467,940 cubic feet of stone take 27 years for 33 quarries to do if they tripled their output. Yeah, and that's assuming no no equipment failures. Yeah, or you're right. Using modern snafus. methods. Snafus. <laughs> These estimates were based on the assumption that production would proceed without problems. Then we would be faced with the task of putting the limestone blocks in, in place. The level of accuracy in the base of the Great Pyramid is astounding and is not demanded or even expected by building codes today. Civil engineer Roland Dove of Roland P. Dove & Associates explained that uh, two hundredths of an inch per foot variance was acceptable in modern building, in modern building foundations. But we're talking about one one hundredth of an inch across 35 feet is the pyramid standards. <laughs> and they maintain that across 13 acres of a base. That's woo. Uh, he says, when I informed him of the minute variation in the foundation of the Great Pyramid, he expressed disbelief and agreed with me that in this particular phase of construction, the builders of the pyramid exhibited a state of the art that would be considered advanced by modern standards. In Pyramid Odyssey, William Fix stated that the most accurate survey of the base of the Great Pyramid showed it as 3,023.13 feet around the perimeter, with the average of the sides being 755.78 feet. If the alignment of this structure was governed by today's building standards, then one side of the Great Pyramid would be allowed a variation of 15.115 inches. Hmm. But it has, like... Almost no variation. That's, I mean, a, a variation of 15 inches would be huge on the Great Pyramid, and it's not. It's like... He's talking about the length of the sides? He's saying if, if we had a... If we, by, by modern building codes, if you had a foundation that was that big, that was 755.78 feet on a side, you would be yeah. allowed a deviation of 15 inches all the way across that thing. Right. Yeah, there is a, a strange thing about the... The deviations on the sides, the lengths of the sides. I think he's talking about up or down. Okay, <clears throat> that's what I was, was wondering. The level. Yeah. Okay. All right, let me, okay. From their precisely leveled plateau, the ancient pyramid builders raised a mountain of limestone and granite with the same care and precision which, with, with which they laid the foundation. The estimated height of the Great Pyramid is 480.95 feet. It is estimated, estimated to weigh 5,300,000 tons and contain 2,300,000 blocks of stone. The stones that make up the bulk of the pyramid are limestone, which was quarried locally on the plateau itself and in the Mokatam Hills across the Nile River 20 miles away. The inner stones are of poorer quality and are known as nummulitic, Nummulitic is used to describe round fossil shells. It literally means coin-shaped. So maybe it's pneumolytic, like numismatic. Mm. The composition of the stone is calcium carbonate, which is an important <clears throat> fact to remember when we later look at the evidence that supports my theory. The quantity of stone that had to be quarried, hauled, and hoisted into place in the Great Pyramid becomes even more impressive when it is compared with other civil engineering feats, whether real or imagined. <clears throat> It has been stated that it contains more stone than, it, than that used in all the churches, cathedrals, and chapels built in England since the time of Christ. <laughs> oh so the pyramid has more blocks of stone in it 
than every building built in Europe in the past 2,000 years. Not every building, but every cathedral, church, and is that what he said? Every, yeah, every church, cathedral, and chapel. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> Holy crap. That really puts it in perspective, right? 30 Empire State Buildings could be built with the estimated 2,300,000 stones. A wall three feet high and one foot thick could be built across the United States and back using the amount of masonry contained in the Great Pyramid. <laughs> He's just like got multiple ways of trying to illustrate how much rock we're talking about here. Adding to the mystery of the Great Pyramid is the fact that its shape appears to incorporate the mathematical function of pi. This incommensurable number, 3.14159 ad infinitum, exists in a pyramid when the angle of the pyramid sides is 51 degrees, 51 minutes, and 14 seconds per side. Oh, I did get that right. Cool. I knew it was 5151, but I was guessing at the 14 the last time I said it. Mm. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Given such an angle, the perimeter of the pyramid is in relationship to its height as the circumference of a circle is to its radius. I love that. So, like, if you take, if you measure all the way around the base of the pyramid and then turn that measurement into the circumference of a circle, the radius of that circle is the height of the pyramid. Yeah. It's genius. Yep. <laughs> It may be stretching the truth a little to say that the Great Pyramid had this exact angle or that it was the builder's expressed intention to have a structure that exhibited this mathematical constant. Still, it was certainly close. Petrie's measurements unequivocally show that the angle of the sides of the pyramid was constructed with remarkable precision. He wrote, quote, On the whole, we probably cannot do better than take 51 degrees, 52 minutes, plus or minus 2 minutes, as the nearest approximation to the mean angle of the pyramid, allowing some weight to the south side, unquote. Having worked with blueprints where tolerances on angles are frequently given as plus or minus one degree, unless otherwise specified, I am certain that Petrie's measurements indicate that the angle of the Great Pyramid was a critical part. So he's talking about, you know, he worked with plenty of blueprints where the tolerances are plus or minus one degree, but Petrie gives a plus or minus two minutes. Yeah. As we can see, there, oh, whoops, that's not, I'm not supposed to read that. Okay, I'm not reading the whole book to you guys. <laughs> I am skipping like whole sentences in some places. <laughs> it is difficult to ascertain what the Japanese Nippon Corporation was trying to prove when, in 1978, they attempted to erect a 60 foot pyramid in Egypt. Under prescribed conditions, they received permission from the Egyptian government to erect a pyramid southeast of, uh, southeast of the, on the Giza Plateau. They were to use the same methods that the original pyramid builders supposedly used. They were not to use the stone from the plateau itself, but from the quarry that provided the original blocks. The rules were that after Nippon had finished this demonstration, they were to dismantle their pyramid and restore the site to its original condition. Agreeing to these stipulations, the Japanese set to work, quarrying, hauling, and erecting approximately one ton blocks of limestone. The reports and films taken of this operation revealed the difficulties they encountered during their long and difficult task. task. Reportedly, their first difficulty was getting the stones across the Nile. In Pyramid Prophecies, Max Toth wrote, quote, Once cut into approximate one ton blocks, the stones could not be barged across the River Nile. Flotation apparently was not the simple answer, as had been suggested. The blocks finally had to be ferried across by steamboat. Then teams of 100 workers each tried to move these stones over the sand, and they could not move them even an inch. <laughs> Modern construction equipment had to be resorted to, and once again, when the blocks of stones were finally brought to the building site, the teams could not lift their individual stones more than a foot. In the final construction step, a crane and helicopter were used to position the blocks. <laughs> this almost always happens they set out to do it in the quote unquote primitive way and they end up using helicopters and cranes and steam barges <laughs> and freaking metal tools and just it's, they can't do it <laughs> okay next spot here yeah, he goes on to say that they like some other people started giving the, the Japanese crap like oh they didn't really try hard enough right, and yeah. blah 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 false 
I don't I don't agree with that. The Japanese are well. They uh, so so somebody else demonstrated that if you make a like a slurry of mud or whatever that you can slide it across can, the sand. Yeah, and then they found out that like one person can can slide the rock along. Yeah, that's what was reported. Yeah, I don't know if that was ever demonstrated. Does he say that was demonstrated? I don't. I don't remember. But th- they say that they say that because there's like one <clears throat> there's one image somewhere. Of of ancient Egyptians supposedly moving oh, something, right. yeah. thing, and it shows a guy dumping something yeah. onto the sand in front, and they and they all say that that's how it was done, but I don't know if anybody's actually demonstrated it. Yeah, I think that they did demonstrate oh, this, okay. but I'm wondering if it was the sand, or were they doing this on a hard surface? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, because I still can't. I mean, the sand's going to give way. Yeah, underneath, unless you pack it hard right. somehow. Yeah, and still with a with a one ton block with a small surface area. Yeah, it's going to dig in. Yeah. No, it doesn't matter how wet the sand is. <laughs> okay, so Dunn says, as I have suggested, if we look at the history of manufacturing, we will find that the evolution of machine tools has resulted in a quality of product that was not possible 100 years ago. The accuracy and repeatability of these machine tools is such that the accuracy and replicability of some of the work they produce may not be necessary for the product to fun- function properly. <clears throat> The machines are built to produce highly accurate and consistent products without regard to the level of importance each feature may have in the final product. One viewpoint may be, therefore, that the pyramid builders had created machinery with a state-of-the-art in cutting and dressing stone that was incapable of producing low-quality work. This may seem a far-fetched idea on the surface, but as I will show in the next chapter, advanced methods of machining stone are clearly evident in artifacts from that period. With the Great Pyramid, we are faced with an artifact that exhibits a state of the art in manufacturing and construction that we do not find necessary for specification of modern buildings. In fact, artisans who provide materials and erect modern buildings do not even relate to the tolerances that must have been imposed on the creators of the Great Pyramid. It was with this realization that I continued my study and tried to imagine what recreating it would take. The Great Pyramid speaks of a highly skilled an intelligent body of people who conceived and executed a design with an attention to detail that is utterly astounding. A tremendous amount of resources must have been made available for it. Graham Hancock said it very nicely in a documentary I take I, I had taken part in. Quote, The builders of the pyramids speak to us across the centuries and say, we are not fools. Take us seriously. Unquote. His comment sums up exactly the conclusions I had reached in 1977. The pyramid builders are, were as intelligent as we are. How they applied their knowledge may have been different, but it is obvious that they possessed sufficient knowledge to create an artifact having distinct features that so far we have not been able to repeat. The bald fact is that the Great Pyramid, by any standard, old or new, is the largest and most accurately constructed building in the world. <clears throat> and take a break. Yeah. And we're at uh, chapter four. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back. Yep. relentless and unstoppable pursuit of pyramids is what I meant to say (laughs) on the first break. (laughs) Snake Bros Institute for Advanced Pyramidian Studies. (laughs) Pyramidian Studies, yes. We should have, uh, we should have Pyramidian certificates as well. Yes. We can put on our walls and fridges with quantum sticking devices. Pyramidian Studies. (laughs) There are instantaneous degrees and diplomas. Yeah. I think Angie said that she uh, she can she commented that she confessed to being a pyramidian. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Full That's confession. Great. Yeah, yeah. So we are. The, I guess we could call the um, you know the Egyptologists uh, like pyramidatards or something. <laughs> 
They think there are too many pyramids in Egypt. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I think that's hilarious. <laughs> there are too many. Dang it. All right, so chapter four. He's So we got some digressions here in the book, but the, all this stuff is fascinating. He says the Aswan quarries were educational. Uh, though, although after returning to Cairo the following day and while strolling around the Giza Plateau later in the week, I started to question the quarry marks at Aswan even more. So he was advised to go to see the unfinished obelisk. Because yeah. there are quote unquote quarry marks there that show how they were digging it out with, yeah. with diorite balls. Right? right. So he goes, he, he says he dutifully buys a plane ticket, flies there and he goes, nope. And then comes back and then he sees more granite lying around on the Giza Plateau with saw marks and stuff and he's just like no yeah yeah but this is really fascinating right here he says south of the second pyramid i found an abundance of quarry marks of similar nature similar nature to the ones he saw at Aswan. Mm -hmm. the granite casing stones ha that had sheathed the second pyramid were stripped off and lying around the base in various stages of destruction some of the stones were still in place those sections had been split away from them and there I found the same quarry marks that I had seen earlier in the week at Aswan. This puzzled me. Disregarding the impossibility of Egyptologists' theories on the ancient pyramid builders' quarrying methods, I wondered if these theories were valid even from a non-technical logical viewpoint. If those quarry marks distinctively identify the people who created the pyramids, why would they engage in such a tremendous amount of di extremely difficult work only to, to destroy that work after having completed it? Because he's finding those same quarry marks on the destruction part of the granite casing. Mm -hmm. So he's like, if this is distinctive to them, like he was told, but then he sees where the granite casing has been being taken apart right. some at some point in antiquity, and he sees the same quarry marks. He's like, okay, so they were tearing it apart? Those same people that were... I was told we're making those court distinctive quarry marks yeah. in the Aswan quarry. Great point. Okay. Um, this is a, an aside, but one of the pyramids was encased in granite. Yeah. One of the pyramids was encased in limestone, the yeah. Great Pyramid, presumably. Yeah. So you, the granite was black. Right. So you have a white pyramid, a black pyramid, and a red pyramid. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. Very and Atlantean. Plato's, yeah. <laughs> White yeah. stone, black stone, red stone. Right. So it's like, I'm not saying that Giza is Atlantis. What I'm saying but is built by, built by the same people or people that were influenced by yeah. that culture. And there's also the, because because it's granite, limestone, and sandstone. Yes. That's fire, earth, and water. According to John Anthony West. Granite is fire, limestone is water, sandstone is earth. Hmm. That's cool. Yep. Alchemy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they, they are the philosopher's stones. Yeah. And they are those elements. Turning. If you think about it, granite is fire stone. It is igneous, yeah. abyssal igneous, right? And limestone they, is deposited by water. Yeah. And sandstone is made of earth. It's just genius. <laughs> I think it's and great. And they can turn, what, what does the philosopher's stone do? It turns something into gold. Yeah, everlasting life. And then it gives you everlasting and life. And allows right? you to, it not just turn that stuff into gold, but to transmutate right. stuff into other stuff. Less valuable things into more Sounds like things. a transducer. So it's just yes. power, power related. Right, yeah. That's the point, yeah. Life, Right. Yeah. And power. Yeah. <clears throat> but I find this whole quarry mark thing great. He's just like, okay, same marks here on whoever was destroying the granite casing of right. this pyramid. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. Sorry. I just got distracted no, no, by, that's, the, that's... by the granite. Yeah. I just I remembered, that he, <laughs> you know, <laughs> wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. It seemed to me that the quarry marks at Aswan and on the Giza Plateau were made at a later time. And that they were created by people who were interested only in obtaining granite without caring about its source. Mm -hmm. Possible. It could be other reasons, but yes, I agree. Not the original builders. Okay. There is a persistent belief among some Egyptologists that the granite used in the Great Pyramid was cut using copper chisels. I.E.S. Edwards, British Egyptologist and the world's foremost expert on pyramids, said, quote, 
Quarrymen of the Pyramid Age would have accused Greek historian Strabo of understatement as they hacked at the stubborn granite of Aswan. Their axes and chisels were made of copper hardened by hammering, unquote. Having worked with copper on numerous occasions and having hardened it in the manner suggested above, I was struck that this statement was entirely ridiculous. You can certainly work hardened copper by striking it repeatedly or even by bending it. However, after a specific hardness has been reached, the copper will begin to split and break. This is why when copper is worked to any great extent, it has to be periodically annealed. Right? That's how you say that? Yeah. Or softened in order to keep it in one piece. Even after being hardened in this manner, the copper is not capable of cutting granite. The hardest copper alloy in existence today in existence today is beryllium copper. There is no evidence to suggest that the ancient Egyptians possessed this alloy, but even if they did, even this alloy is still not hard enough to cut granite. <laughs> Yet copper has been described as the only metal available to the craftspeople building the Great Pyramid. Consequently, it would follow that all work must have sprung from their use of this basic metallic element. Theorists may be entirely wrong, however, even in their basic assumption that copper was the only metal available to the ancient Egyptians. Another little-known fact about the pyramid builders is that they were iron makers as well. You will not find much reference to this fact in textbooks, as researchers have only found one piece of wrought iron, and because of its singularity, Egyptologists have not attached much significance to it. Howard Vise's assistant. But you find one half of an upside down, badly written cartouche, <laughs> and it freaking tells you everything that you want it to say. Bam! Great point. Holy crap. Fantastic point, Mr. Co host. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Howard Vise's assistant, J.R. Hill, discovered this wrought iron within one of the joints of the Great Pyramid's limestone masonry in 1837. From there, it was delivered to the British Museum, as it was the only piece of iron ever found from that era. Its impact was not significant enough to change our concept of world history. However, it is important to note that if there was an abundance of iron or steel at the time of the Great Pyramid's building, its survival would be dependent on some kind of sanctuary from the elements, such as being buried in the limestone of the pyramid. Recent analysis of this metal discovered that it had traces of gold on one surface, as though it had been gold-plated at one time. Transmutated? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Today's granite cutting methods include the use of wire saws and an abrasive, usually silicone carbide, which has a hardness comparable with diamond and, therefore, is hard enough to cut through the quartz crystal in the granite. The wire is a continuous loop that is held by two wheels, one of the wheels being the driver. Between the wheels, which can vary in distance depending on the size of the machine, the granite is cut by being pushed against the wire or by being held firmly and allowing the wire to feed through it. The wire does not actually cut the granite, but is designed to effectively hold the silicon carbide grit that in fact does the cutting. <clears throat> Wanting to know more about the sawing of granite, I consulted John Barta of the John Barta Company, who informed me that wire saws used in quarry mills today cut through granite with great rapidity. In fact, Barta told me that wire saws with silicone carbide cut through the granite like it is butter. Out of interest, I asked Barta what he thought of the copper chisel theory proposed by Egyptologists. Suffice it to say that Barta, being from Cleveland and possessing an excellent sense of humor, came forth with some jocular remarks regarding the practicality of such an idea. <laughs> Being from Cleveland. <laughs> right. <laughs> also of, unpublishable. Right. Lots of swear words and jokes. <laughs> <laughs> and dispar general disparaging remarks. Uh, let's see. Next part. Regarding tool marks that left a spiral groove on a core taken out of a hole drilled into a piece of granite. So here we go on core number seven again. I got this just, we've gone through some of this before, but all of this is great. Petrie wrote, on the granite core number seven, the spiral of the cut sinks one tenth of an inch in the circumference of six inches or one in 60, a rate of plowing out of the quartz and feldspar, which is astonishing, unquote. After reading this, I had to agree with Petrie. This was an incredible feed rate distance, which is distance traveled per revolution of the drill for drilling into any material, let alone granite, I was completely confounded as to how a drill could achieve this feed rate. 
Petrie was so astounded by these artifacts that he attempted to explain them at three different points in one chapter of his book. No pun, no pun intended. Three different points. <laughs> to an engineer in the 1880s, what Petrie was looking at was an anomaly. The characteristics of the holes, the cores that came out of them, and the tool marks would be an impossibility, according to any conventional theory of ancient Egyptian craftsmanship, even with the technology available in Petrie's day. Three distinct characteristics of the hole and core, as illustrated in figure 21, make the artifacts rem rem extremely remarkable. And so here he lists these uh, features. One, a taper on both the hole and the core. Two, a symmetrical heliacal groove following, or a helical? Yeah, helical groove following these tapers, showing that the drill advanced into the granite at a feed rate of one-tenth of an inch per revolution. The confounding and three four the confounding fact that the spiral groove cut deeper through the quartz than through the softer feldspar around it. In conventional machining, the reverse would be the case. In 1983, Donald Ron of Ron Granite Surface Plate Company told me that diamond drills rotating at 900 revolutions per minute penetrate granite at the rate of one inch in five minutes. In 1996, Eric Lyther of Truestone. Corporation told me that these parameters have not changed since then. Since then, the feed rate of modern drills, therefore, calculates to be uh, two ten thousandths. Is that right? Two ten thousandths of an inch, right? Per revolution. Two thousandths. No, hundreds, thousands, ten thousandths. Hundred. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, ten hundred thousand, yeah, ten yeah. thousand. That's right. So two ten thousandths of an inch per revolution, indicating that the ancient Egyptians drilled into granite with a feed rate that was 500 times greater or deeper per revolution of the drill than the modern drills. So remember in, the, in, his, in Dunn's later book, Lost Technologies of Ancient Egypt, he says he'd not in, he's not saying that they went faster, 500 times faster, just that per revolution they went 500 times deeper than we do. Right. So he's saying, he's thinking the rev, it was revolving slowly but vibrating very fast in his idea of ultrasonic drilling. Yes. So it doesn't mean that they were like, and tore through it real quick. And quickly. really with the ultrasonic, you, did you mark any of the ultrasonic drilling or can we talk about that? Uh, yeah. I don't know, probably. Okay, so yeah, what, he, what he's talking about with the ultrasonic drilling, that, number one, this would be why, for example, it would drill through the quartz faster than some of the other stuff. Right, because the quartz would respond. The yeah. quartz is a, is a much, you know, much more resonant material yeah. um so that would explain that aspect of it and then in terms of the revolution of the drill head you would only need to do that to make the core and the hole um more even basically uh homogenous in a way right yeah so so because your tool would be wearing out and yeah. you've got all these different inclusions in the granite there may be a whole bunch of inclusions in one side of the granite that you're drilling through that are less so in the other side, which would put the the uh, feed rate on that side faster. The other side, say if it was harder to drill through and you weren't rotating your drill head, but you were just using the ultrasound, it would wear that side of the tool Very more quick, so yeah. than the other side, and then right. you would end up with a problem. But the other reason to to revolve or rotate the, the drill the is to remove material. Yeah. So you can. I keep telling people that, like, even of, of even even complicated drill heads, they all spin slowly because that's how you draw the material out. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you're you you wouldn't even necessarily have to. You wouldn't have to do it fast. You can rotate it very slowly. Right. The drilling action is is the ultrasound vibration. Yeah. The Look turning at, action is to keep it everything yes. the same and That's also right. remove material. Look at like we have large drill bits now that have like multiple cutting heads on the tips that all spin very quickly. But that whole assembly rotates slowly in order to draw the material out of the yeah. hole. Right. Yeah. So. OK, what's the next thing? Okay. And, an, and another aspect of it was the possibility that this cut on the core this spiral cut on the core itself was due to the drawing out of the tool yeah. and like some piece that was... Yeah, but he, he actually, he, he goes through all that and he's like, no, what he thinks is that the tool is fat and gets thinner as it goes up. And as they're drilling, 
it's wearing out. Right. And that's why it's tapered on both sides, yes. inside and out. Right. Right. Because as the tool starts out real fat, the cutting tip. Right. And as it works its way down, it's the tool is also being burned away. So it's getting thinner and thinner as the hole gets deeper and deeper, and that's right. why you have a taper. I think that's probably the best explanation. I'm not talking about the taper. I'm talking about the spiral, the, the spiral cut. spiral, yeah. But if it was getting thinner and thinner, then when you drew it back out, it wouldn't touch anything because right. there's a taper. That's true. So. That was one of the theories that was about that <laughs> yes. cut, though. Yeah, that, that, as, that it was drawing out was causing those yeah. cuts. And he's like, no. Because you have taper on both right. sides, yeah. it, it makes cannot. Sense. Yeah. It can't cut it when it's it coming cut out. out. It to, right. It can't. It had to do it on the way in. Right. For those who may still believe in the official chronology of the historical development of metals, identifying copper as the metal the ancient Egyptians used for cutting granite is like saying that aluminum could be cut using a chisel fashioned out of butter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's great. GMA. Try to cut some aluminum on your lathe with butter. I want to see what happens. <laughs> Spin it really fast. Yeah. We'll get back to us on that experiment. Freeze the butter. <laughs> like cold butter through aluminum? Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> copper, Freeze that butter with, with liquid nitrogen. Yeah, that copper get cut that, through that granite like cold butter through aluminum. <laughs> uh, what follows is a more feasible and logical method, and it provides an answer to the question of the techniques the ancient Egyptians may have used in all aspects of their work. So he goes through some of the core cutting that we just talked about, so I'm not going to read it. I'm trying to skip stuff here, guys. I'm trying to help you. <laughs> trying to help me skip stuff. It's good. So he says, as this book was being prepared for publication, I re received an unexpected email from Nova's stonemason, Roger Hopkins who had read my article about ancient Egyptian technology on the internet. He wrote, Dear Chris, you are a voice in the wilderness. I just finished reading your article about stoneworking techniques in ancient Egypt. I am a stonemason by trade, and in 1991, the PBS series Nova invited me to go to Egypt to experiment with building a pyramid. I quickly got bored with working the soft limestone and started to ponder the granite work. So, Because he's a granite yeah. stonemason, right? Here in Massachusetts, my speciality is working in granite. <clears throat> when I was asked about the Egyptologists, how the, oh, by the way, he gives his website, which if anybody is interested is tiac.net. So T-I-A-C.net. Check it out. When I was asked about the Egyptologists, how the ancients could have produced this work with mere copper tools, I told them they were crazy and that they were the Egyptians were using at least state-of-the-art techniques. At first glance, I tend to agree with you about the ultrasonic core hole drilling. I do enough core hole drilling to know that the embedded scrape marks would not be the result of ordinary core drilling. I would love to explore this technique further with you and perhaps do a presentation in our next film about Egypt. Sincerely, Roger Hopkins. So Dunn says, in my subsequent communications with Hopkins, I found him to be very honest and straightforward regarding the techniques used by the ancients. His account of the building of the Nova Pyramid was much the same as that reported by Mark Lehner. He asked my permission to pursue the ultrasonic drilling aspects as it was my idea, and I told him, the more the merrier. That's pretty cool. Wonder how that went. <clears throat> okay, so now we're... Next chapter here, and Dunn is now in the pyramid. So he's recounting. He says, Crouching through the entrance passage and into the bedrock chamber, I climbed inside the box <laughs> and with a flashlight in the parallel was astounded. To, oh, he's actually in the... Um, in the coffer. Yes, and he's in the coffer in the second pyramid. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Not in the Great Pyramid. Because he, he wanted to go check this one out because Petrie kept mentioning how it was superior. Right. Okay, so he says, I climbed inside the box and with a flashlight and the parallel was astounded to find the surface on the inside of the box perfectly smooth and perfectly flat. Placing the edge of the parallel against the surface, I shone my flashlight behind it. No light came through the interface. No matter where I moved the par parallel, vertically, horizontally, sliding it along as one would, ga one would a gauge on a, pre a precision surface plate. So in other words, the same way you test a flat, the flatness of a plate, moving it back and forth with the light. I, he says, I could not detect any deviation from a perfectly flat surface. A group of Spanish tourists found my activity extremely interesting 
And as they gathered around me, as I had, uh, animatedly dis demonstrated my discovery while exclaiming into my tape recorder, space age precision. The tour guides were becoming quite animated too. <laughs> I sensed that they probably did not think it was appropriate for a live foreigner to be where they believed a dead Egyptian should go. <laughs> so I respectfully removed myself from the sarcophagus and continued my examination visually from the outside of the box. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. I was doing science. <laughs> yeah. There were more features on this artifact that I wanted to inspect, of course, but I did not have the freedom to do so. The corner radii on the inside appeared to be uniform all around, with no variation of precision on the surface to the tangency point. I was tempted to take a wax impression, but the hovering guides expecting bribes inhibited this activity. I was on a very tight budget. <laughs> <laughs> My mind was racing as I lowered myself into the narrow confines of the entrance shaft and climbed to the outside of the pyramid. The inside of a huge granite box had been finished off to an accuracy that modern manufacturers reserve for precision surface plates. How did the ancient Egyptians achieve this? And why did they do it? Why did they find that box so important that they would go to such trouble? It would be impossible to do that kind of work on the inside of an object by hand. Even with modern machinery, it would be a very difficult and complicated task. Another point to consider was that the box, and the one in the king's chamber inside the Great Pyramid, did not have to be made out of one piece if the only purpose it served was to house a dead body. There is evidence in the Cairo Museum proving that the ancient Egyptians also constructed sarcophagi out of five pieces and a lid. So why did they find it necessary to create each of these two boxes out of single blocks? which required the extra planning and effort to lower them into their chambers rather than drag them through the passages. Or they actually did the machining after it was put in the chamber. Right. Which is probably... Tuned it. That's right. Yeah. While Hancock and Baval were filming... So he, he, now he's more... This is more travelogue. I jumped down into a crypt and placed my... Oh, so they're in the Serapium and placed my parallel against the outside surface of the box. It was perfectly flat. I shone the flashlight and found no deviation from a perfectly flat surface. I clambered through a broken out edge into this inside of another giant box, and again, I was astonished to find it astoundingly flat. I looked for errors and could not find any. I wished at that time that I had the proper equipment to scan the entire surface and ascertain the full scope of the work. Nonetheless, I was perfectly happy to use my flashlight and straight edge and stand in awe of this incredibly precise and incredibly huge artifact. Checking the lid and the surface on which it sat, I found them to both be perfectly flat. It occurred to me that this gave the manufacturers of this piece a perfect seal. Two perfectly flat surfaces pressed together with the weight of one pushing out the air between the two surfaces. The technical difficulties in finishing the inside of that piece made the sarcophagus in Khafre's pyramid seem simple in comparison. <laughs> Canadian researcher Robert McKinty was accompanying me at this time. He saw the significance of the discovery and was filming with his camera. At that moment, I knew how Howard Carter must have felt when he discovered Tutankhamun's tomb. This is cool stuff about the Serapium here. Yeah. I was so astonished by this find that it did not occur to me until later that the builders of these relics, for some esoteric reason, intended for them to be ultra precise. They had gone to the trouble to take unfinished products into the tunnel and finish it underground for a good reason. It is the logical thing to do if you require a high, dis high degree of precision in the piece that you are working. To finish it with such precision at a site that maintained a different atmosphere and a different temperature, such as in the open under the hot sun, would mean that when it was finally installed in the cool cave-like temperatures of the tunnel, the workpiece would lose precision. The granite would give up heat, and in doing so, change its shape through contraction. The solution then, as we do now, of course, was to prepare precision objects in a location that had the same heat and humidity in which they were going to be housed. This discovery and the realization of its critical importance to the artisans that built it went beyond my wildest dreams of discoveries to be made in Egypt. For a man of my inclinations, this was better than King Tut's tomb. The Egyptians' intentions with respect to precision are perfectly clear, but to what end? Further studies of these artifacts should include thorough mapping and inspection with the following tools. One, a laser for checking surface flatness, typically used for aligning precision machine beds, like an auto collimator, basically, he's talking about there, I think. Mm -hmm. 
an ultrasonic thickness gauge to check the thickness of the walls to determine their consistency to uniform thickness, and three, an optical flat with monochromatic light source to determine if the surfaces really are finished to optical precision. GMA gave us a lesson on optical, optical flatness in history of precision. Check it out. Get your uh, used Russian optical flats. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> on, Soviet. On eBay. Used Soviet optical flats on eBay. <laughs> and Dun check your own pyramid boxes. <laughs> Dunn says he contacted four precision granite manufacturers in the United States to, to, and not one could do that kind of work as uh, is found in the Serapium. And we've talked about that multiple times. True Stone Corp. They were like, yeah, yeah, we bring it in in five pieces and mm -hmm. assemble it on site with bolts and stuff. But <clears throat> we uh, we at the end here. Close. Yeah. Maybe go a little bit over. Let's see if we can yeah. finish this. Uh... Okay. He says, to fully appreciate the value of this kind of research, we should keep in mind that the interpretation and understanding of a civilization's level of technology has predominantly hinged on the preservation of writ or written records. But for the majority of us, the nuts and bolts of our society do not always make interesting reading. In the same way, an ancient stone mural, mural will more likely have been cut to convey an ideological message rather than to preserve the information regarding the technique used to inscribe it. That's right. <laughs> Moreover, the records of technology developed by our modern civilization rest in media that is vulnerable and could conceivably cease to exist in the event of a worldwide catastrophe, such as a nuclear war or another ice age. Our legacy will likely be read in the tangible remains of our society. Consequently, after several thousand years, somebody looking back would most probably arrive at a more accurate interpretation of us and our society from our artisans' methods rather than an interpretation of our languages. So in here, he's basically arguing against, like, he's basically like, these Egyptologists are art historians that are reading stuff yeah. and telling us a story. And he's like, no, no, I'm looking at their, the, the artifacts, and they're arguing with me and pointing to, like, written stuff and saying there's no evidence of what you're saying in this written shit. And right. he's like, there never is. You know? Yep. <clears throat> Rarely. Sometimes obelisks said they were made with electrum. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes it happens. Okay, he says, A French chemist named Joseph Davidovitz rocked the world with a startling new theory on pyramid construction. So I wanted to go through this because people have been asking this in the comments. He proposed that the blocks used to construct the pyramids and temples in Egypt were actually cast in place by pouring geopolymer materials into molds. In 1982, he analyzed limestone given to him by a French Egyptologist, uh, Jean-Philippe Lauer, which was taken from the ascending passage of the Great Pyramid and also the outer casing stones of a pyramid in Teti. In his book, The Pyramids and Enigma Solved, he reported, quote, X-ray chemical analysis detects bulk chemical composition. These tests undoubtedly show that Lauer's samples are man-made. The samples contain mineral elements highly uncommon in natural limestone, and these foreign minerals can take part in the production of geopolymeric binders. The sample from the Teddy Pyramid is lighter in density than the sample from Khufu's Pyramid, which is the Great Pyramid. That sample is weak and extremely weathered, and it lacks one of the mi minerals found in the sample from the Great Pyramid. <clears throat> the samples contain some phosphate minerals, one of which was identified as brushite which is thought to represent an organic material occurring in bird droppings, bone, and teeth, but would be rare to find brushite in natural limestone. So Dunn says, Davidovitz theory, I think I'm saying that right, da Davidovitz, David, yeah, looks like Davidovitz to me, theory, it re we received worldwide attention and I was challenged by several people to reconcile the theory that I was proposing with his. I have no difficulty recognizing, reconciling my analysis of the cutting methods of the ancient pyramid builders with what he was proposing, and I am sure he will see our individual efforts in the same light. <clears throat> Davidovitz cited pyramids and temples of Giza in which Petrie devoted an entire chapter to the tool marks found on various artifacts made of both igneous and sedimentary rock. These artifacts were found inside and outside the Great Pyramid. The tool marks on the stone tell us that they were cut, not poured. Nevertheless, this oversight should not entirely discredit Davidovitz's findings. Construction technology today employs many techniques, cutting, forming, and pouring, to name a few. Thus, 
I believe it is short-sighted for me or anyone else to discover one method of manufacture or construction and present it as the only method used by the pyramid builders. Davidovitz made a strong argument for his cast-in-place theory by pointing out the impossibility of the Egyptians having moved the huge monolithic blocks of stone that were used to build the pyramids. In most construction projects, if there is an option to do so, it does make sense to prepare a mold or a form and pour the material if the alternative is lifting and moving large masses weighing up to 200 tons. He claimed that he had solved the problems associated with moving such huge stones with his cast-in-place theory. However, evidence that argues against the casting of igneous-type rock can be found in the rock tunnels at Saqqara. These are the giant granite and basalt boxes that weigh in and around 80 tons each. The existence of a roughed-out box and more than 20 finished boxes situated underground essentially disproves the argument that they were cast. We can speculate that when the craftspeople finished working the rough box, which is now wedged in one of the underground passageways, they would have had to have moved it into place without the benefit of hundreds of workers. That in and of itself is an impossibility. Furthermore, the very fact that this one box is rough cut belies the use of a casting method. If the Egyptians had cast these objects, they would not have chosen the characteristics of the roughed out box for the mold. The product would be much closer to the finished dimensions of the other boxes, and more than likely the surfaces would be flatter than they actually are. These speculations do not mean that the ancient Egyptians did not use geopolymers. They simply mean that there may have been more than one method used to build the pyramids. So yeah. I agree with all that. I really like that that point that he I mean, he makes that point multiple times throughout the book, too, that, you know, when these guys are stacking up these blocks using ropes and, you know, hand tools and stuff, he's like, yeah, yeah that's one way you can do it. Yeah. That's just because you can do it that way doesn't mean that that's, that's the, how it was done. The only way it was done, right. you know. That's because they have the assumption of the least advanced butt flap. Yeah, principle. exactly. What they're trying to do is prove that it can be done with the least advanced butt flap that they've come up with. Right. And because they assume that that is the that that is the case, they're like, if we can prove that it can be done this way, then our least then advanced butt flap is correct. Right. Yeah. It allows us to maintain the least advanced butt flap principle. <laughs> right. But I, it just in general, I like, I mean, it's it's just a great thing to keep in mind all the time when looking at these things is that, that even in modern times, we have a lot of different construction methods to do things. Yeah. Most of the arguments on construction sites are about using different methods of doing right. stuff. Right. <laughs> You've I'm got doing, the blueprints. Yeah. You know what you have to build. Right. It's I'm all, doing it this way. And somebody's like, you should do it this way. And I'm like, no, my way is better. And they're yeah. like, no, no, this way is better. And I'm like, God damn it. Come on, Johns. <laughs> Come on, Johns. <laughs> yeah, many ways of doing stuff. Okay, so that puts us at the beginning of Chapter 6, Coral Castle. Oh, yes. So I think we'll close it out there, and we can get into that next episode. How many, how many is it going to take, man? I don't know. Twelve? <laughs> right, chapter 6, and we're... I, I just have to say, though, that the, the history of the discoveries in the pyramid and all of the analysis on everything um, that he does in this book is just. Yeah. I mean, this this book is a gem. Yeah. Really is. I mean, I could keep going, but we're. Yeah, I know. We I know. No, we're, we're good. Yeah. yeah. We got to stop. So. Yeah. <laughs> You guys can get a hold of us, brothersoftheserpent at gmail.com. Check the website, brothersoftheserpent.com. You can go to the Encyclopedia or the Glossary there or buy some snake skins, T-shirts, pillows, bags. Uh, support, man bags. Yeah, man bags. Support us uh, on our pyramid scheme. Send us straight to pyramids. It's called the Snake Bros Pyramid Scheme. You can find it on the website. That also has a link to our Patreon. Give us reviews. Mostly on iTunes, that helps us a lot with the spreading the shows. Share the shows anywhere you can. Twitter, on Facebook. Uh, follow us on Twitter, at Snake Rosa, no vowels, S-N-K-B-R-S. There's also a Facebook group, Brothers of the Serpent, run by Jordan. Thanks very much to him. There is a brand new Discord server. So anyone, and we are, we will actually be in there. I'm in there already. Kyle will be in there. He has a Discord account. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's a good place to chat. And you guys can, you know, give us you know, insults and stuff like that. We're actually in there. We can read the read what you're saying. So join the Discord. Uh, also, Library of the Serpent, done by Jeff. We really appreciate that. He's constantly building it and adding stuff. And uh, also, History Shift. Follow him on Twitter, at History Shift. He does all of our videos. So you can find us on YouTube, Brothers of the Serpent on YouTube. He also has a YouTube channel, and he has a website, historyshift.com. 
uh, Pod Doodles. This guy draws, he, he does doodling while listening to the podcast, so you can listen to the audio of our podcast while he's drawing stuff that he comes up with during, while listening. It's really cool. And he's done many other podcasts as well, so check him out on Twitter and on uh, YouTube. And also, I want to remember to mention the Cosmographia uh, podcast that we're doing with Randall. Most of you probably know about it by now, but if not, check it out. Cosmographia. You can find it on Geocosmic Rex or on the Cosmographia channel on YouTube. And there's also an RSS feed. So that's us with Brad and Randall. Randall's podcast. Yeah. And sometimes uh, Mike. Yes. Sometimes Mike. And uh, let's see. The Contact the Cabin 2020 Scablands trip with Randall is coming up. Get in touch with Darren at Grimerica.com if you guys want to get on the list for that. Uh, the, the cost is a bit up there, but he's got payment plans. So if you start now, you can, you can get it paid for by the time it, it starts. Yeah. yeah. And thanks again to Commander Frank. Yes. S- Commander Frank. <laughs> Snake Bros. Snake Force Commander. <laughs> thanks, buddy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, we go. We love you guys. Good night, Adamu. Get back to work. Have a Merry Christmas. Happy Holidays. Yeah.